Good morning. We are so happy that you're here with us today. I am Teresa Cordoba, Director of Great Cities Institutes. And on behalf of Great Cities Institute, the Center for Global Health, and the Global Migration Group of the UIC Illinois Humanities, welcome to UIC. Welcome to this event. We're very happy that you are here. I want to acknowledge not only the great, fantastic Great Cities Institute staff, but also the foundation's Healthy Communities Foundation. They do some awesome work in this city and the Chicago Community Trust for their support of this program. So we're happy you're here and we're gonna get going. We have a very full program for you today with a keynote followed by a series of, of three panels. So with that, what I would like to do um, is turn it over to Mr. Steve Wine who will introduce our keynote speaker. Dr. Steve Wine. Thank you, Teresa. Okay, good morning. Thanks very much, Teresa. So I'm Steve Wine, Professor of Psychiatry, Director of Global Medicine and the Center for Global Health in the College of Medicine here at UIC. And it's really my great honor and privilege to welcome Luis Zayas, who's Dean and Chair in Mental Health and Social Policy at the University of Texas at Austin. He's also the author of this book, Forgotten Citizens, Deportation, Children, and the Making of American Exiles and Orphans, which I highly, highly recommend. I read it. Every word of it, it's fantastic. Um, Dr. Zayas is a clinician and a scientist, and um, I would say a literary documentarian. Um, for years, he's been on the front lines of the struggle to understand and address children and families who are collateral damage of punitive immigration policies. I don't need to remind you that nowadays, with the White House policy of zero tolerance, we're in a new and deliberately cruel chapter of that ongoing story of threat, separation, exile, and orphaning. Dr. Zayas, thank you very much for joining us today. We're so glad that you're gonna share with us your stories, your findings, your analysis and recommendations to help us better understand what practices and advocacy and policies we need now to address this national and global tragedy. Thanks, welcome Dr. Zayas. Steve laid out a big agenda for me. I had a shorter one, but I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, there, there we are. So I, um, I want to thank, thank everyone for the invitation to the uh, Great Cities Institute, the, thank you very much, the Center for Global Health and the uh, Global Migration Working Group for the invitation to be here today. And uh, any chance I get to, um, to talk about something that I'm very passionate about and moved by, um, I always accept the invitation. Uh, my recent work has really focused on two groups of children, those who are U.S. citizen children born to undocumented parents. Uh, that's the, the, the topic of the book that Dr. Wine just mentioned. And the other are the refugee children and their mothers, particularly, who have been in immigration detention in, in, uh, in South Texas for the most part, and I'll tell you more about that. And so with the time I have today, I'd like to focus on the refugee children who have uh, come across our border primarily since 2014. So this is, so I'll talk about refugee children and the mothers and then talk about some of the implications for early child development, but even for child de childhood development in general. There is this uh, very aggressive immigration environment going on. Uh, Dr. Wine mentioned it and I think it doesn't take uh, but one glance at a newspaper or at the evening news to see that it's happening, it's happening constantly and it's really been a hostile and callous in the manner that it's been uh, undertaken. And frankly, I thought it was bad during the Obama administration, and now I look back on those days with, with such wistfulness uh, that, you know, uh, in my book I, I, I criticize his administration, and maybe in the next edition I'll, I'll clean it up and say, well, he tried his best, uh, given the circumstances uh, that, that we see. The, so a lot of the work that I'm, I'll tell you about is work that I've done as a clinician, as an advocate in Texas. Uh, going into the detention centers, getting to know the families, interviewing them, writing up evaluations of the children uh, and the impact on detention so that uh, attorneys can represent them in asylum hearings. And from here, we, uh, we hope to conduct some research that, you know, 
fingers crossed, the funding should be coming in soon uh, from NICHD to be able to, to uh, study some of these kids after they've been released from detention. And so there's, there's a, a few things we have to think about. When, when I go into a detention center uh, like Dilly or Carnes the, in, in South Texas, um, I hear stories and we have detected, not just me but others, that there are really three traumas that occur uh, to most of the children and moms that we have seen. First, it's their in-country uh, trauma, the, uh, the pre-migration trauma, which is often uh, full of violence and death and horrors and poverty and ransoms and kidnappings and ultimately the family's decision that they've got to flee. Better we should die trying to flee and get to the United States than sit here and be essentially sitting ducks uh, for the gangs and, and others. And we have in those situations police complicity with, with the uh, gang members uh, or, or just simply turning a blind eye. So we have that, um, that to start with. And then they have the in-transit tra uh, migration trauma of what they see along the way in the 1,800 or so miles trekking across uh, the border of Guatemala right up to, to McAllen, Texas in some cases, or other parts having to cross the Sonoran Desert into Arizona, and the, the kinds of struggles, the things they've seen of dead bodies uh, being held for ransom, sometimes uh, being held for two or three weeks in dungeon-like conditions while they amass enough uh, migrants that they can, the coyotes can bring them across the border. And what children see, what women experience, what young girls experience, and what uh, teenage boys will experience is, is horrific. So we hear those stories. So we've got mounting levels of trauma. And then when they think that they're in the United States and they're now in safe hands, um, which is what they all say. They say, look, we, we're taking our chances going there because we know that U.S. law will protect us, that you all do due process. Um, they don't say y'all. Um, that's, that's Texas. That's when they're, once they're acculturated, they use that term. Um, but we know that the United States uh, has due process and treats people well. That they, you know you can expect a certain process. Well, it, it's, we wish it was that, that simple. We know that Customs and Border Patrol agents don't necessarily treat families and kids uh, as nicely as they would like to be treated. And so what I'd like to do is start uh, and give you some idea of the pre-migration trauma that was drawn for me by a six-year-old boy in one of the detention centers in Carnes, uh, particularly. So this boy, uh, I asked him, why don't you tell me about what it was like in your little uh, village in Honduras? And he said, well, here's what happened. The Revos Locos, these are the, the Maras and the gangsters, the Revos Locos were just, you know, essentially running amok in our, in our village. And I said, what makes them revos locos? What makes them gangsters? Six years old. Oh, they smoke cigarettes. They smoke cigarettes and they have armas de fuego. They have handguns. Or, and so that they're shooting, that they're smoking, um, that they're doing all sorts of things. I'm sorry, this is washed out. It's just his drawing. And at the bottom here, you have um, um, pictures of them burning houses, shooting up uh, uh, just, just generally shooting up uh, people, and uh, many of them are also the, the maras uh, on the revos locos using drugs. And so, and look at that, look at the sun at the top, uh, how, how upset the sun is and terrified by what they, this boy experienced in his, in his village. And he tells me then his particular story, and that is that um, his, he, one day he was, uh, well, he was being bullied by some of the boys, older boys, uh, who were kind of uh, maras in the making, and uh, his mother uh, kind of called them in. He learned one day that his uncle had been shot. Um, that's the uncle over there in the far, your far left, um, on the ground with the red stain. The maras locos had gone into his home. By the way, they, they, they went around drinking, drinking beer, shooting at animals like birds, um, and that... He went to see his uncle when they heard that he, three men had come into the living room and shot him. And so this six-year-old boy is telling me that um, when he got there, he saw his uncle's teeth coming out of the back of his head. So it's not the kind of thing a six-year-old makes up. They've got to have seen that to imagine that this man gets shot and that's what bullets do, do to you. And then, uh, so there is his uh, uncle, they're dead. Those are his grandparents and they lived on a lomo, a small hill. Uh, so that they had houses, but you know, separate enough that, that they could be near one another pretty quickly. Those are his grandparents. So what he and his mother and his brother did, and his father said, let's flee. So they, they set off uh, to, to get to Mexico. But the father, who is here at the bottom, I hope some of you can see it. Um, here's his mother and his father, and they have a nice home. 
um, with trees and things around the side. But his father uh, is an amputee and, and, and uses a crutch. So he tells us, well, he told me that he, he said they set out to, to flee the gangs, but they couldn't because the father's crutch just wouldn't let them go. So they came home, and it's hard to say if they were there a day, two days, three days. He's a six-year-old. Um, but then they set out again. And at the border, the father says, I can't, I can't do it. So why don't you take, he said to his wife, take the boy and, and his brother and, and set off. And he tells me how sad it was saying goodbye to his father uh, and, and, his, and his crutch because his father could not make, him, make it uh, with them. So they managed to get uh, to the U.S. and were detained, uh, uh, placed in detention. They had now settled somewhere in central Florida. And I don't know if the father is with them or, or what became of the father, whether he ever saw him again or, 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 or what. Um, by the way, I, I, I will share this PowerPoint minus those drawings because these are proprietary and the, the attorney that works on this case and I agreed that we, it's not something we want uh, kind of distributed because uh, there may not be that many amputees in some villages that might identify the father <laughs> rather quickly. Um, so they enter the US, they are sent to Yeleras, aptly called ice boxes, um, where the temperature is kept at 50 degrees uh, and lights are kept on for the, the whole time. You can see here, it's uh, just 30 or so people in a room for 48 to 72 hours. That's, that's the first stop. No bathing, uh, very little food, you know, uh, I guess uh, processed turkey between two pieces of bread, that sort of thing. And that's where they spend the first 48 hours. Now, Ayelera, as you see in the, in, the far, in the back, they have a, a, a cooler, water cooler. That's a half wall there. Behind that is one toilet for 30 people for the 48 hours that they are there, which means that for that time, you're doing your business exposed to everyone else. That's the kind of cruelty and you know, dehumanization that goes on uh, in these settings. So I, I, you'll see I go between being the scientist and being the advocate, an angry advocate at that. But this is, this is what, uh, what a Yelera looks like. And I think uh, spend some time in your own home setting the, the temperature at 50 and with few clothes and, and, and not take a shower for a few days, and you can feel uh, what it must be like. Here's another Yelera here. They're, they're, they're sleeping. Uh, and covered, but it's essentially the same. You see the toilet paper at the half wall. This is where they spend their first 48 hours. So I tell you about the pre-migration trauma, the in-transit, and the post-migration. Then they're probably sent to a place like this, uh, Dilly, Texas, which is, was built uh, in late 2014, maybe 2015, after, after Carnes, which was opened in, in, 20, in the summer of 2014. And in this place, they house somewhere like 2,500 uh, moms and kids. And it's more of a, a campus-like setting might be uh, a little too, uh, too nice. It really, if you look at, at these, it, it looks much more like those uh, pictures from the internment camps of World War II, Manzanar, and places like that, uh, you know, where you have these, these just tents, rows and rows of tents uh, going on. And this is, this, this is uh, Dilly, and it's, it's, it's a shame. It's run by the uh, Core Civic, the Corrections Corporation of America, under ICE control. The mental health and health services are provided by the US government, but still we have situations where children are sent to hospitals. Uh, if anything happens, they're always, if, if the child is sick, give them some water. That's, that's the, the first antidote to the problems. Then there's Carnes, where I spent more time uh, uh, meeting kids and families. And this is an old, as you see at the top, left. Uh, it's an old county facility where, that housed uh, uh, male felons. And um, so there's high walls. And the children during the time that they're there would, they would not see anything outside. So we see the suspension of their development, uh, the, the uh, expected developmental activities. They can't go anywhere. They can't do anything. And, um, and it's, it's simply that, a prison. It's run by GEO. Today, it houses fathers and sons. In, in, uh, up to about, a, I don't know, six months, uh, a year ago, it converted to fathers and sons. Uh, and I haven't been there since. But I have to confess that I, I committed a crime when I going in. Uh, I was looking at a file that of a little girl I was going to evaluate, and it was her birthday that day. So I went to my, my favorite bakery, and I got two, two cupcakes, one for her and one for her mom. And I snuck them in to my hand puppets that were in my bag, and they went through the, the x-ray, and they didn't catch it, so that little girl for that day had a birthday cupcake, which uh, I was so proud of, and uh, guilty as charged, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but it was, you know, it, it, it's what little things you can do, and the delight in their eyes that someone had remembered um, her birthday. I'm sorry. 
And here's, here's what we know about detention. It, it really, there's two things that are pervasive in detention, besides the day-to-day -day, um, humiliations and problems. It's just that there's, there's this constant sense of deprivation. You do not have any sort of freedom. The developmental, developmentally appropriate uh, uh, environmental inputs and activities are gone. Mothers cannot cook for their children. They cannot discipline their children. Uh, in places like Carnes, where four families, three to four families, might be in one cell on bunk beds. Uh, yeah, you see there, that's one of the cells. There may be several families in here. So if a mom wants to be in one of these bunks with her child to do their evening prayers, or tell stories, or just be together, they're always in the presence of other people milling about, other families, uh, other mothers who might be criticizing your, your parenting. Uh, so they're, the parent has lost all sorts of, of uh, the authority that parents have over their children. So that's gone, and the children see, see their parents disempowered by, by the guards. The guards are the ones that call the shots, not the parents. Uh, so there's that constant threat of deprivation. You're not getting the freedoms that you have. The other is the threat. There's always the fear that something is going to happen to you, whether it's psychological uh, uh, injury or physical injury. And the guards um, that are hired by these private prison corporations uh, are not necessarily kind people. They're, they're desperate people looking for work. And one of the reasons they house them uh, in remote parts of Texas is that so that family can't get to them uh, and the attorneys have a hard time driving there. So it would take me two hours from my home to get to, the, to, to Carnes and about the, same time, uh, about the same time to get to Dilly. And uh, inevitably, I would schedule an appointment at 10 a.m., and I'd get there at 9.30, and then they would harass me uh, about why I was there, and no, we don't have the paperwork, and they'd be going back to the offices, doing all sorts of things to make it difficult for me to get my job done. So by the time I got to be in front of the family, it was an hour late, and then we start the interview, and I start assessing the child and the mom, and what we have after that is, uh, oh, it's time to go to lunch. Hurry up, hurry up, gotta go to lunch. And so they're disrupting my interview, and then, so I'm, I'm staying there later and calling home, honey, I'll be home later, um, that sort of thing. Uh, and it's, it's intentional, it's intentional. So it's that sort of threat that we as professionals who are free to go about feel that constant you know, threat uh, that we might be let in, that we might not be let in. What happens to the moms and the kids is that they are left feeling uh, that anything could happen. At one moment, uh, oh, you're gonna be deported, or maybe you'll get to stay. Or, you know, these are the guards uh, and, and what they're told by folks. Um, that you might be let out, we don't know if you're gonna let out, or maybe you're gonna have to go back to that village in Honduras or Guatemala, wherever it is, and you're gonna to have to, so there's that. Uh, and then the, 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 the guards will look at kids and intimidate them and things like that. So that is, that is the, the, the kind of the, the, the overall uh, environment that they, that they face. And we know the dehumanization of, the, of detention, and we've seen the effects uh, on many of the mothers and the kids uh, depression, we have seen self-harm. I have uh, evaluated one uh, teenage boy who was suicidal and a mom who not, was not only suicidal, she made a, a pretty serious suicide attempt. Uh, actually, she was in the news and was released uh, by the intervention of, of Joe Biden when he was in office. Uh, and emotional disturbances we, we begin to see, but you can understand being in detention, any of us would, be, would have reactions. We have seen uh, Mom, moms and kids who will starve themselves voluntarily. Sometimes it's because of the psychological trauma. Sometimes it's because the, the food in the detention centers is awful and not, uh, not to their palate. Uh, and then the other thing is that many of them are Central Americans, but they're fed Mexican Tex-Mex food. Uh, and it's, it's, not, uh, it's just assumed that that must be what they eat, uh, but they don't necessarily eat that, uh, that food. A lot of boredom uh, and sadness among the kids. Uh, and the sense of hopelessness, especially among the teenagers who feel like, what's going to happen to me? My, my education has now been truncated. Um, I can't go anywhere. What's going to happen to me? Will I go back? And what's, what's it going to take for me to get back on track to be able to go to an American college and, and pursue an education? Um, uh, we have seen developmental regressions. Uh, infants who have been weaned from breastfeeding now resorting, uh, or young children, resorting to breastfeeding. I had one nine-year-old who was insisting on being breastfed by her mother. 
and, and, and that was a problem. And not only that, but then the mom was being hassled by the other mothers in the cell saying, oh, you can't do that, she's nine years old, what's wrong with your child? So this is a mother who's struggling and uh, not necessarily all of the other uh, moms are kind to one another. And that may be part of what being incarcerated does. You turn on each other. Uh, we've seen regressions in language, bedwetting, breastfeeding, um, uh, less so, uh, you know, uh, daytime enuresis, mostly nocturnal enuresis, but uh, we see that, and, and a lot of social withdrawal. But then again, I don't, there's, 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 there's hope on the horizon that some of the kids, the way they, they manage and they thrive. Uh, there's a teenage boy that I call the poet um, who told me that um, he had arrived at the detention center, was placed with the teenage boys on the second floor, teenage girls were on the lower floor, and that he was reading the great, uh, the great uh, writers of Latin America, and he was quoting them left and right. I was fascinated. One of those times that you drop the clinician thing and you become more of just the interviewer because you're interested. And, he, and that was the way he coped. And, and I said, well, how about the other boys with you? Well, they were laughing at me. Because here you got you know, teenage boys, and here's this kid reading the great, you know, Vargas Llosa and all of those wonderful, uh, Gabriela Mistral and all those great writers. And he said, well, they, they goofed on me and everything, but I would always have a quote for them to kind of tell them what they, uh, give, them give them a quote that resonated with whatever they were saying. And I said, oh, so how, what happened? He says, oh, within a month, we were all reading the great, uh, the great writers of Latin America. And he helped himself, but helped others endure the pain. He is now somewhere in, um, uh, in the Northwest uh, Oregon or, or Washington. I gave him my, my card. I said, when you want to come to college, you let me know. We will, we will work things out at uh, Austin, although he probably doesn't want us to come to Texas again. As I mentioned, the, the impact on parenting, uh, the parenting is thwarted. They, the mothers cannot give adequate care, they can't prepare their meals, they can't come for their children. All of the, the roles that we expect in a family, the rituals, all of that is, is disrupted. And there's a lot of guilt. Why did I do this? Should I have done this? Uh, should we have left? Would it have been better to have endured what happened in our country than to endure this? And, and there's a lot of an awful experiences for, for parents uh, during the time that they're there. Um, if we talk about the younger children, Particularly now, when I was uh, most active, the moms were in detention with their kids, so that there was very little disruption in their relationship other than what I just described. Now, with the family separation, we're seeing very vastly different sorts of reactions. And we can see the damage to the parent-infant uh, attachment and bonding. The parents are, tension, are, are tense and anxious. Uh, the maternal deprivation, uh, de depression, of course, and we're thinking about young children where there's, you know, uh, important developmental, sensitive developmental periods, um, and we see the disruption in their socio-emotional development, their cognition, their language, and ultimately their health, as we know about adverse childhood experiences and the impact they have over time. What I'd like to do is play this uh, short video um, of, of Sammy and his mom reuniting. He's from Honduras came with his father, and his, uh, his baby sister, and his mom. They were separated at the border. Uh, Sammy and his father were sent one way. Mom and the baby girl were sent in another place. When father arrived at the detention center, Sammy, little Sammy, was separated from his, uh, uh, from his dad. Then they got together, and they reunited with the mother three and a half months later. He's, he's uh, about three years old, a little under three years old. And this is what... Um, the experience was. So for those of you who, who know something about infant attachment and insecurity, watch this child's uh, reaction. You can read it. Um, I am your mommy. Yo soy tu mommy. Um, and she's asking the husband, ever, que tiene mi hijo? Um, the boy is running away from his mom. He hasn't seen her. This is the signs of that, you know, insecure, avoidant behavior. The child has some disorganized kind of sense of a working model of his mom. And his mom is, of course, you know, um, devastated. You have to hear the, the, the pain in her voice to really appreciate the impact that this video uh, or that this experience had. But you saw the, the, the attachment reaction. And this is just three and a half months. He avoids his mom. He thinks, you left me. He doesn't understand that a government agency decision caused this rupture in their relationship. How long is it going to take us? What's going to happen to Sammy and his future? What will you, the clinicians, in your, in, your, in your community practice, what are you going to face and how are you going to deal with that? Do the uh, trauma-informed child interventions work 
under circumstances like this. It probably does, but you're going to have to do a lot of adapting and tweaking and making culturally uh, appropriate to this group of people. It's what we are facing, and in the long run, um, I think it's going to be terribly damaging. Um, just quickly, um, this is uh, last August. This is young Diego, who was released from the Berks, Pennsylvania Detention Center after being there for two years. Two thirds of his life were spent behind bars. And his mother's quoted in the, uh, in the Huffington Post saying, he learned how to walk and talk there. That's where he learned everything. In the picture at the bottom right is his first dinner at a restaurant, meal at a restaurant uh, in his life because he was so young um, and uh, it wasn't the, they didn't have the resources. To, so this is the first time he's having a, a dinner outside of detention in a restaurant where he's being served. We do know about the brain development and the sensitive periods, how important they are. Um, the brain development can be shaped by adverse events that occur during these sensitive moments. We are talking about sensitive moment, moments, whether it's the young children or even the older children, meaning uh, school-aged children. We, we can talk about developmental trauma and whether this disorder which has been proposed, does it really apply? Uh, the dysregulation of children's stress responses, we saw it in Sammy. What will, what will happen to Sammy without your intervention? What, what can we expect of him? What kind of relationship will he be able to forge again with his mom? And what will be his interpersonal relations with others beyond uh, as, he grows, as he grows up? You know, uh, there will be difficulty with self-esteem regulation and functional impairments in all sorts of areas. Um, and again, the, the long-term effects, will, that, will I be returned to my home country? There's a lot of uh, awful memories that they'll have, both from the pre, in transit, and post-migration uh, experiences. We, we will probably see numbness and dissociative experiences, um, feeling criminalized. Uh, and this, this has been shown with children who have been held in other settings. It's, it's very new, this phenomenon, so we don't have enough data to, to be able to state what, happens, what will happen to these kids in the long run. We do know what we have from the literature on children who have had other, other awful experiences like that. Uh, and so the sense of safety and, and uh, well-being is, will be shattered. Um, you've seen the, uh, the uh, pediatrics, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics statement on, on uh, detention and the impact on immigrant children. It's something you should all read and certainly use whenever you get a chance to testify in court. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. The first panel, if they would come up, please, to the, to the uh, stage, Tanya Cabrera, Miguel Cabrillin, Patricia Macias Roas, Mary Meg McCarthy, Swapna Reddy, and Claudia Valenzuela. Um, you know what, Dr. Zayas, uh, as they're coming up, first of all, I want to let you know that in, the, in your program, uh, you have everyone's bios, so I'm not going to read the bios. You can see who they are and their organizational affiliation. As they're getting seated, um, also I want to remind you about the PowerPoint that Dr. Zayas said he would share. We will have that up on our website, Great Cities Institute, and also the Center for Global Health, along with a video that Spiel Productions um, is, uh, is putting together for us. So I think, I think they're just about ready. But do you have a, we have a quick question for Dr. Zayas as we're getting seated here, very quick one, or do you want to go ahead and wait until the third one? Okay, uh, I want to also acknowledge, oh, we got one. Where are you? Okay, quick question. Go ahead, ma'am. Okay, with that, we've got panel one uh, seated. I want to acknowledge in the house with us here today is Dr. Amalia Payares, who is our Vice Chancellor of Diversity. Dr. Payares, thank you very much for being here. 
Um, and also uh, Rick Estrada from the, the CEO of the Metropolitan Family Services, which is the oldest um, and biggest uh, social service agency in the, uh, in the city. So thank you, Mr. Estrada, for being here. Um, okay, with that, we're ready. Ready to rock and roll. So here's how this is going to happen. They're going to each give a few minutes of opening comments, and then, um, then we'll leave the remaining time for some follow-up questions uh, from me, and, um, and then and we'll, just, we'll keep it rolling. So with that, um, I don't know, we've got you listed as alphabetical order in the program, but we can start from our left and, and move this way if you'd like. Or maybe Mary Mae, would you like to start? I'm going to see the most of my time to my colleague, Claudia Valenzuela, who is the director of um, the National Immigrant Justice Center's detention project. But I, I just want to say right now, I think we are at an unprecedented time of attacks on immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. And it's happening at the border. It's happening in the interior. It is all around us. And what we really need to be doing as civil society is calling for an end to this enforcement and detention apparatus. The abuse, as Doctor said earlier in his keynote address, is horrendous. But it, it is happening in the communities too, as many of you know. The abuse is just fear of walking out your door and not knowing if you're gonna be stopped. And you may even be a US citizen, but a person of color. So we have a campaign going on called Defund ICE. And I have some materials here to provide you to be involved. We, as civil society, forced President Trump to say, I am ending family separation. Is that happening? No, not 100%. But civil society had an impact. The media had an impact, and I think we cannot forget that. So I'm going to pass the microphone on and happy to answer questions. Yes. Dr. Macias. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So good morning. My own work looks at the ways in which the politics and policies of mass incarceration have transformed detention and deportation. And so I started my research almost 20 years ago just after the passage of the 1996 immigration law, which as you know, fundamentally transformed the immigration system at the border. Uh, and I was doing the research just in the aftermath of 9-11. And so I had the opportunity, both through historical research and ethnographic fieldwork on the US-Mexico border, and through interviews with, um, or actually over 150 interviews with border agents, police and sheriff, Mexican officials from, Ian, from the Instituto Nacional de Migración, the Mexican consulate, NGOs, migrants in transit, deportees, and border residents, to, to start to document these changes then uh, that just blew my mind. And so at the time, Congress had poured all this money into border policing under this rhetoric of fighting terrorism. But what I witnessed on the border back then wasn't matching up with that rhetoric. What I was seeing instead was this blend of immigration and crime control that began well before 9-11. Uh, and so what I saw you know, was, again, back then, agents uh, processing people according to criminal history and not just legal status. I saw new border crossers landing in prison people who had never been in the U.S. whose first experience of this country was in a prison. I saw legal permanent residents with their status revoked and you know, deported uh, after living in the U.S. for decades. Um, indigenous people on the Arizona border, Mexican Americans in heavily policed communities who were being criminally prosecuted for immigration crimes. And so I wrote my first book as an investigation of how we got here. Uh, that in a sense I wanted to understand and, and provide some context context for this new enforcement landscape and this unprecedented rise in deportations, detentions, and criminal prosecutions for immigration offenses. And so I'm excited to engage this topic, and I'm hoping that um, sort of my presence here will contribute to, to kind of highlighting some of these larger processes that we then see manifesting in the psychosocial state of children, youth, and their families. Thank you. Dr. Macias has a, a wonderful book also that you might want to check out. She interviewed a lot of the border, uh, border agents um, and has there's a lot of insights there about, about how they function, right, and including some details even on some of these contracts 
um, the detention contracts, which is, I think, a really important part of the story as well. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. My name is Swapna Reddy, and I'm co-founder and co-director of the Asylum Seeker Advocacy Project, ASAP. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we do. Um, prior to this family separation crisis, it just so happened that we were already representing kind of the core population uh, that has been affected by this. Uh, we primarily serve Central American asylum seekers, not because we're partial to Central American asylum seekers, but because they have been really uh, targeted for enforcement in a pretty brutal way for a long time now, not just during the Trump administration, uh, but also during the Obama administration uh, when the Obama administration built what is now currently the largest immigration detention center in the country uh, in Dilly, Texas, which was built to hold 2,400 women and children at once. Um, even under the prior administration, the norm was separation. It might have not been separation of mother from minor child, but it was separation of if a family unit came and a child was one was six and one was 19 and there was a mom and a father, the father would be sent to one detention center, the mother and minor child would be sent to one detention center, and the 19-year-old child would be sent to a third. So if that's not family separation, I'm not sure uh, what is. That's been going on for a while now. It's continuing to be the norm. Um, you know, during the family separation crisis uh, that kind of peaked this summer, what was new was that even mothers were being separated from minor children and children of an extremely young age. So um, yes, that's extremely horrific. As you learned in the keynote, there have been some really terrible uh, repercussions from that. But we've been seeing, um, honestly, the majority of clients we've been working with show symptoms of PTSD for many years now uh, because of what they've been facing under um, these detention and deportation regimes. Um, in terms of our work, we're kind of a gap-filling organization. We try to represent people and bring resources to people uh, who don't have the good fortune to live in cities where there are really extraordinary organizations like the ones my panelists are representing. So uh, we primarily represent people in places like rural Texas, rural North Carolina, rural Indiana, um, all over the United States. To date, we've represented over 400 people in over 30 states. So uh, kind of we're willing to represent people anywhere with the one criteria being that we're completely non-competitive. So if there's a local org that can represent a family, uh, we'll happily send them um, that way. One of the things that we do to stay in touch with all of these families that are being released from the detention centers are we partner with organizations on the ground in detention centers, uh, the nonprofit organizations, not the ICE enforcement uh, and CBP enforcement agents, and we uh, get their information and get them looped into an online community that we run. We have about 3,000 formerly detained mothers in that community. And I'd say 90% of the value of that community is the mothers talking to each other. So uh, they are a really enormous source of inspiration and support for each other. We'll have someone post, I've had this ankle monitor on for 18 months. It's extremely painful. I don't know what to do. I want to give up. And dozens of people will respond and say, keep at it. I got mine removed after two years. Or, you know, I know mine, it's awful for me too. But there's a way for families to kind of connect with each other about the horrific things that they're facing. Um, the 10% of value I think that we add, besides having kind of convened the group, is uh, that we answer questions, uh, you know, thousands of questions a year in that space um, to our membership about uh, kind of all of these enforcements. When a doomsday title hits the news lines, uh, hits the newspapers, our clients will ask us, or the members of the group will ask, kind of, is, can I even apply for asylum anymore? Is it even possible to go to immigration court anymore? And we'll be able to tell thousands of people at once you know, yes, it's possible to apply. Here's how it got harder. Here's what you need to do in response, uh, things like that. Uh, you know, we can't represent, provide full legal representation to everyone in the group, but we can contextualize what's happening. Um, for instance, I know something that Miguel's organization is working on is um, fighting back against this new rule that's trying to punish people for taking public benefits and say, well, maybe you can't get a green card anymore if you've done that. When that came down, we had you know, hundreds of people interested to know is the fact that they took food stamps for their children going to be the reason that they all get deported and we're able to contextualize that and say, it hasn't passed yet, here's what might pass, here's how it will and won't affect asylum seekers, things like that. Um, from that, we take some cases for full representation, specifically cases of members in the group who live in places where we know there's honestly not really hope of them finding free legal representation of their own. Um, and we try to represent them wherever they are um, one of the hugest barriers that we're seeing from asylum seekers after they're leaving the detention center is that they can't afford to live anywhere very convenient. And even if they can find an attorney who's willing to provide them free legal representation wherever they are, it's almost impossible for a lot of these families to get there. They're in places without public transportation. They can't get work authorization. They can't afford a car. They can't get a driver's license in most of the states that they're in. 
Um, so there's just a lot of hurdles that these families are facing, and we try to take on cases for representation and represent people in a way that they can, frankly, prepare the ma vast majority of their case from their home. They don't need to go anywhere to talk to us. We try to connect with them in the same methods that they're connecting with their own families abroad. So we talk to people via WhatsApp. We text them. Like, whatever it is that is working for them in their normal life is how we try to meet them um, for representation. Thank and then you. I guess. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no that's fine. fine. <laughs> go, go ahead and say your last thing. Go ahead. The last thing I was going to say is that um, the newest area of our work um, is that we are um, trying to fight back about what's happening. So we recently settled the first lawsuit um, in the country challenging um, how these families, the inhumane detention conditions that you found about, um, heard about in the keynote, um, and set, got a, a good monetary settlement for a family who had been uh, suffered separation and are planning to bring a lot more lawsuits to help these families fight back about what's happened to them so far. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Miguel Caberlein, and I, I've spent the better part of my career representing migrant and seasonal farm workers in um, various contexts. And I sort of want to share a little historical context so that people can understand a little bit more about some of the other factors that drive migration to the United States. And one of those being is that we want a workforce, especially when it comes to our food, that is very cheap and exploitable. And I can tell you is there are roughly four million migrant farm workers in the United States at any peak time. And about half of those are undocumented workers. They're workers that we are telling them as a society, come here, we need you to come do this work. And the historical context for that is, after slavery ended, very little changed for African American workers on plantations. And we get to the 1930s, and we're trying to come out of the Great Depression, and FDR tries to pass the New Deal legislation. So that is the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is the law that tells us all our work week is 40 hours, we get paid overtime, all of those things. The Social Security Act, and the National Labor Relations Board Act, which provides protections for people who want to unionize. So to get that legislation passed, he had to agree to exclude farm workers from all of that legislation. Why? Because they were African American. And so those laws, for the most part, still exist that way today. Farm workers are not entitled to overtime pay. Farm work is also one of the most dangerous occupations we have when it comes to workplace injuries. It's the only one we allow kids as young as 12 to work in legally. So you can be a child, 12 years old, and be working with some of the most dangerous pesticides known to man. You couldn't flip a burger at McDonald's, right? And so beyond that, I think many people have heard of the Bracero program that started and how awful it was. It was so awful that before we even ended that, we started a new guest worker program called the H2 program, which still exists today. So we have the H-2A visa, which is for people coming in to work in agriculture, and H-2B for those in other low-wage work. These, this program and our desire to have cheap food and a workforce that will do this drives a lot of the migration that comes back and forth. And for a lot of these families, we're talking youth, family separation is not a new thing. It's just a much more newsworthy thing now. It's been happening for years and years. And it is one of those things that people sometimes say, well, you know, four million people, migrant farm workers, maybe they're not related to me. I can tell you this, you can't eat almost anything in this country that wasn't first touched by the hands of migrant farm workers in some way. And so it is a very important issue to look at and understanding we have this workforce we want here that is cheap and exploitable, and we are asking them to come here. Right, so that is definitely one of the issues that drives migration. Hi everyone, I just wanted to thank the University of Illinois for hosting this event and for all of you, uh, to all of you for being here to, hear, uh, to discuss and have a conversation about this very timely topic. Um, the enforcement, um, immigration enforcement of immigrant communities, both in terms of those who are recent arrivals at the border, but also for long-term residents that have lived within the United States for years, even decades as we know, has you know, really been steadily and frighteningly getting um, stepped up over the past two decades, really. And just to build on what um, Dr. Macias had already you know, established, 
uh, with the legislative changes of 1996, really laid the framework for what we're seeing today. And we are here 22 years later with no change in that law. Now, for a long time, those laws lay somewhat dormant, somewhat unenforced. They were really triggered in the aftermath of September 11th when we really saw them you know, really uh, given life by, by the enforcement. And so in some ways, while we can talk about what this administration has done and how harsh the immigration enforcement is, and to be sure, we are seeing some unprecedented use of enforcement in this, in this time, but we'd already been seeing this escalation over the past two decades under, including under the Obama administration when you know, many of us held hope that um, there would be some legislative reform and unfortunately um, it did not materialize because for those of us who have been working with, um, particularly on the legal representation side, seeing the, the lack of re, uh, recourse for immigrants who face deportation proceedings, we knew how difficult um, it was for individuals facing deportation in the United States. Couple that with an increasingly uh, large detention system um, where the default is detain and deport. And it's really been a pattern that has been increasing, particularly, I would say, over these past two decades. Um, I think there definitely um, has been, you know, uh, very, uh, Justifiably, a great deal of um, attention on the family separation um, phenomenon this past year, um, especially with the rollout of the zero tolerance policy by the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security, whereby the um, it was the uh, individuals crossing the border without permission were prioritized for federal prosecution, regardless of whether they were with children or without children. And uh, as part of that uh, policy, children were separated from their parents. And I think that we really w should be very vigilant of that. And, and especially because I would really emphasize for those families, the hope of asylum may not materialize because at the same time, the laws are becoming so harsh and Attorney General Sessions has definitely made it a point to issue uh, guidance restricting uh, the ability to seek asylum. But I do also want to emphasize, in addition to very vulnerable communities, youth and families, that for a long time we've been seeing really harsh consequences for those living in the United States, in communities, in the interior, particularly those who encounter the criminal justice system, immigrants who go through that um, system, um, who themselves might be you know, victims of violence and trauma, and we're seeing cycles being repeated, right? Poverty and trauma can lead to encounters with the criminal justice system, can then lead to you know, a, a de deportation process coupled with these harsh laws that don't give you a second opportunity to remain, no matter how much you may show rehabilitation, no matter how many significant family ties you may have in the United States. I really you know, uh, hope we can keep that community in mind as well, because one of the things that we see through our work is just the long-term consequences for the children of these men and women who may face deportation, um, who are struggling with many of the same sort of symptoms that Dr. Zayas had covered earlier in the presentation. And it just, um, you know, uh, it's a group that, you know, we don't often like to talk about or want to you know, address, but it's really, I have to say, in some ways very compelling group because of the long ties and the really harsh consequences for the children who get left behind um, within our communities. So I really look forward to this conversation and, and hope that um, you know, we can figure out um, some strategies and, and, and work together to address some of these issues. Thank you, Claudia. Tanya. Thank you. I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, I'm with the Office of Diversity, uh, and a lot of the work that I do supports our current uh, undocumented immigrants here living in Illinois, but also supporting uh, newly refugees and immigrants that are coming in with what options do they have to continue their studies. Um, there's so many layers of immigration and the trauma of immigration uh, that you'll hear today. So many resources. We ask that you share them. Um, be active, we need a lot of help. Uh, uh, but as a collective here on campus, I'm thankful, not only with the Office of Diversity, but with our centers and with our leadership, uh, creating access and opportunities for our students, uh, and not only in, in academics, uh, financial assistance, but uh, self-care and wellness, um, which is a huge part of what uh, we're looking at 
uh, to create some type of support er during these difficult times. And you'll later hear from my colleague uh, uh, and my graduate assistant, Dagmara, and the work that she does uh, to provide support here on campus as well. So one of the, um, I th think it's really important about something that you all brought up was in talking about the context of, of this, where the, where the current laws and how certain laws have not changed um, since 1996, for example. So I'm wondering, for example, why has that law not changed? What's, what are the politics that have made that so difficult? Just some historical antecedents that might shed light on this question. I mean, in my own research, one of the things that has surprised me the most is the overlooked role of liberal Democrats in helping to usher in this punitive turn. Um, it was in the early 90s that former President Clinton and leading Democrats appropriated this tough on crime approach from the GOP and the new right. And it was in the early 90s that Clinton and leading Democrats pledged to take this tough on, uh, uh, tough stance on unauthorized migration. So this was actually before that 1994 midterm election when California passed Proposition 187. So this is before that, right? Uh, that Democrats started using a rhetoric that recast unauthorized migration as a crime. So as early as 92 and 93, Democrats like Feinstein from California, Schumer from New York penned op-eds and introduced punitive immigration bills seeking to deport immigrants with convictions from dangerously overcrowded prisons. So in taking that tough on crime approach, they essentially split the issue of immigration, separating legal from, quote, illegal immigration. They framed legal immigration as something legitimate and morally upright, and unauthorized migration as something illegal, something akin to a criminal act. And so this has had profound, uh, a profound impact, not just on legislations like the um, Ira, Ira, but it has had a profound impact on the immigration discourse in this country. So it, it's important to recall that prior to this period, um, this crime-centered rhetoric did not dominate the public narrative on immigration. To be sure, the Reagan administration passed punitive laws that criminalized immigrants. Certainly, the 1986 Anti-Drug Abuse Act criminalized immigrants. Even IRCA, that's known as a, a legalization provision, had criminal provisions. The Reagan administration also started requiring the detention of Haitian and, and Salvadorans. But opin if you look at opinion polls during that period, uh, from the 60s to the 80s, they suggest that immigration itself was not yet viewed through a lens of criminality. So uh, it was really when Democrats started using that that it shifted the political discourse. And so I think to understand just the persistence of this, it is important to, to consider the role of lead Democrats in shifting that discourse and really recasting unauthorized migration as a crime. So that it, it becomes really hard to contest, you know, these un, uh, really inhumane and cruel policies when, you know, people are saying, well, they broke the law or they're criminal. Like, when did we start talking about immigration in that way? And I think that we, we have to not let, you know, the Democratic Party off the hook on this. And I think that that's part of the persistence. They're supposed to stand for immigrants, but they threw immigrants and people of color under the bus with their criminal justice policies as opposed to migrant labor, for example. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, what were you gonna say? No, I, I think that, that's, that that is the most effective strategy um, by the conservative anti-immigrant movement is to criminalize immigrants. Um, it is no coincidence that immigrants are largely communities of color as well. And I think that especially in the aftermath of September 11th, it was, it was very much resonated, this issue of terrorism and, and fear. And that is a really powerful, effective um, tool, messaging tool, I think, that exists um, that has only gained so much more momentum. And I think the other thing to, to mention is that the immigration debate, how should we fix the law? I really encourage folks to think about that. What, what, what do we want to see in a law? Because it is a very complicated question, and often even on the immigrant advocate side, we don't necessarily all maybe agree or know how is it that we would perceive the law. Um, and I think that there definitely is a danger in you know, separating criminal immigrants 
or the notion of criminalization and the sort of good immigrants or the you know protecting that can help, you know create some roadblocks as well. And I think we really have to really look at how I think to Dr. Macias's point, even within the sort of democratic pro-immigrant conversation, how does that look and how do we move the ball forward for all the community um, at large? But it is a complicated conversation, I think. I would just add one thing. I, I might be even more cynical. I think we just don't have a backbone. We don't, we, we elect people, right, who perpetuate a system that's reactionary. We're not visionary, we're reactionary. And it's the reason why things like family separation happen, and we do, we react as a society, we try to push things, but we don't push far enough in that we don't require the people that we bring into elected office to be visionaries and to actually put themselves on the line where you might not get elected again. Because how many politicians can you actually think of that said, I will do this even if it costs me this position because it's right, right? We don't have those people anymore. And that's us, right? We get the politicians that we vote for or don't vote for. Mary Meg, so. what were you gonna add to this? Uh, I would just add one other piece to it, is the monetary economic impact. I mean, the private prisons, as we've all heard about, are just making a lot of money. I think, you know, some of those private prisons, was it GEO or Core Civic, their stock price went up 30% after the inauguration in January 2017. And many of you may have heard that the Congress is really trying to manipulate the allocations and appropriations that Congress has made to, to increase spending on detention and deportation of immigrants. And, um, and, and it's all coming to light more and more. And I think the private prison industry has a real interest in, in continuing this. And I think that's going to be a big battle for us to change the law because who's getting the money from the private prison companies, a lot of the legislators. And Patricia, and we, you and I have had this conversation before about what some of the clauses and the contracts around the detention centers, um, around this keeping things at a certain capacity. Do you want to say something about that? Um, I'm, I'm not prepared to Okay, do all right, you don't, that's okay. I don't want to put you on the spot. I'm sorry, I, was, I, I, I can address that too. Okay, so go ahead, uh, Claudia, thank um, you. We have a, a site uh, on uh, NIJC's website. I encourage you to visit it, the Immigra Immigration Detention and Human Rights Transparency Project because we have been uh, requesting these contracts via Freedom of Information Act requests and have put them up for the public to see and follow the money that is to be made um, in these contracts, but also the lack of transparency about how the money is being spent once these um, corporations uh, receive the money, or even state governments. You know, here in Illinois, we have three local immigration detention centers. We have over a thousand people detained in our part of the country alone uh, in, in immigration, uh, in county jails that contract with ICE. And, you know, we've made the point that the private prison companies profit from this, but also counties that are impoverished and rely on these lucrative immigration uh, contracts also subsidize their services. And I think what you're referencing is that some of these contracts include a mandatory minimum of folks that would, are being paid to keep a certain amount of individuals, these quotas that are embedded into the funding of immigration contracts and detention, um, which you know, have existed for a while, uh, but it is that incentive to police. And some of these counties even then engage in these 287G agreements with ICE. You may hear of these where they agree to police for ICE. And so you have this stepped up activity in the county to apprehend folks that are then, you know, we talk about, um, my colleagues in the criminal justice movement talk about the, you know, prison, the school to prison pipeline. I think there's also a, you know, community to county jail to deportation pipeline that is happening because of these detention, the way these contracts are set up and the incentives to detain individuals that should otherwise maybe not be detained. In terms of what's come up in my own research is just how connected this is to uh, prison overcrowding and mass incarceration. Uh, and so in my own research, what I, what I found was that through these policies of mass incarceration that created these conditions of intense prison overcrowding to house uh, mostly black and Latino youth, um, that this led in Congress 
to, to attention to targeting uh, immigrants with convictions in the criminal justice system in order to make room right, for, for all the beds that were needed under these criminal sentencing policies. And so you see then a shift in uh, kind of policies targeting immigrants with convictions and that ultimately lead to the 96 law. That 96 law had these det mandatory detention provisions that then create this demand for detention. And that demand for detention kind of creates this new market uh, for these uh, private actors, right? Uh, and so I think it is important that we absolutely pay attention to it because I don't think it was initially about profit, but now we cannot divorce this conversation from these economic aspects of, of companies that are profiting from this and how that's affecting the immigration debate. So I appreciate um, you know, you're, you're bringing this perfect, up. Perfect. Thank you. Go ahead, the question over here. Hi, um, this question is for attorney Reddy and any other, um, anybody else that might have an answer to this. Uh, you spoke about how you recently won a settlement for a family and it was a good settlement. Um, do you guys foresee a possible class action on behalf of the traumatized children against the US government? And if so, uh, what do you think are the biggest challenges to that? So I'll answer both. First, specifically about the damages uh, suit that we brought. Unfortunately, um, I think the government foresaw uh, that a lot of times if one family or one person needed to bring damages, a lot of people would. And so it's not actually possible to bring a class action very simply under like the Federal Torts Claimed Act, Claims Act, which is um, the act that we used in order to get monetary damages for the family. So we do uh, hope to kind of bring a lot of complaints and bring a lot more lawsuits, but unfortunately there isn't a way to bring one and then make it a class action that covers everyone. Um, there are no shortage of people who uh, deserve monetary damages from the government right now. Uh, as a lot of people on the panel were saying, not just asylum seekers, but the way that basically all immigrants are treated when they're detained is inhumane. There's always limited access to medical care. There's always family separation to some degree. There's always kind of just pretty horrific uh, conditions in detention. So um, no, I don't foresee a class action being brought of exactly that nature. However, there are a few class action lawsuits that are currently ongoing and that uh, there's a settlement in the works um, about it. And I think others might wanna add more, but there are lawsuits that are uh, more targeted around um, not monetary damages for families, but changing some of the conditions and the laws um, or you know, getting families, for instance, a, a big lawsuit that was recently reached um, sorry, settlement that was recently reached on behalf of three lawsuits merging together is one that says, you know, you can't have preliminary asylum interviews for families at the most traumatic time of their life. You can't separate a mom from her child and then ask the mom a bunch of detailed questions about why she came, why she's scared to return, you know, what she ate the morning of the day that she fled, et cetera, to try to trip her up on credibility because that's just not a realistic thing to expect from people who have who are separated from their children and, and in ex extreme distress. And so this settlement, this class action settlement that is in um, the works is trying to get new interviews for these families saying, everyone who was interviewed under these horrific conditions needs to be given another chance at a preliminary asylum interview and needs to get a chance to try, like a genuine chance to try to get asylum in the United States. As Claudia suggested, uh, even with another interview, we'll see what happens. Um, asylum law is really, really under attack right now. Um, you know, the ability for families to qualify for domestic violence-based asylum has been attacked. The ability for families to, to get bond and fight most of their asylum trials um, out in the community instead of continuing to fight them from detention is currently uh, something that's uh, maybe going to, to go under attack soon. Um, you know, people are getting scared in so many ways. So um, yes, there are some inspiring class action efforts going on, but like, I don't think most of the problems can be solved that way. I think small ones can be, but I think it kind of goes back to what Miguel was saying, which is like sometimes when horrible things happen, lawyers are the ones who get all the press and people are like, oh, maybe the lawyers will solve it in the courts. Um, but actually it's more important that like everyone remains really invested, that everyone continues to protest, that everyone continues to go to the poll, that everyone starts to register people who haven't voted before and is interested in voting out to the people who are creating the problem and voting in new people because there's only so much, um, honestly, that these lawsuits can create and anyway, all roads end at the Supreme Court um, and that's not going anywhere great right now. So uh, no matter what you can win in these regional uh, federal courts, uh, you know, it's not like things are looking too optimistic at the top. I, I really want to echo that, that point. One, there is a, a class action lawsuit that doesn't seek 
compensation, um, and I know individuals are talking uh, about individual claims to seek compensation for the traumatized children. One thing I would say that is crucial in, in those kinds of cases, and if, so if you are clinicians or future clinicians, we're always looking for pro bono psychological evaluations in our cases for our clients, um, you, because this is a key, crucial showing, sometimes in these claims, but also in the asylum claims. Um, and one of the class actions is asking that the court take into consideration the trauma to the child um, and the uh, inability for the individual to have passed this asylum screening interview. So that's one sort of creative way as how folks are trying to build legally on the trauma. Um, but I think I, I really echo what Swapna says, um, the Supreme Court has narrowed class action generally um, in the context of prisoners, in the context of monetary compensation. And this is another area where the way the immigration detention contracting system is set up, that makes it also very difficult to pursue class actions um, on behalf of immigrants. And I won't get into the law of it, but it just really becomes very difficult. And so I you know, wholeheartedly echo that it's the folks on the outside bringing that public pressure that are sometimes going to make you know, more of a difference um, in some ways. Go ahead, Mary Meg. Um, I would just like to add to what Claudia is saying and um, your question about class actions though is really important. N not for monetary damages, but for twofold. One, to hold the government responsible to making sure they're following the law and two, to stop unconstitutional practices. So we're litigating two major lawsuits, class action lawsuits. One, where the government, once the child turns 18, they're putting them in adult detention facilities. And so the law says, hey, you should be looking at alternatives um, to custody for these children that are the least restrictive. And the government has created this blanket policy that's like immediately putting a child in McHenry County Jail or some private prison down in Texas. So that's happening. And once that class, and the class was recently certified, that's intimidating the government um, because they know this is gonna have national impact. And then the other one is that we filed was one here in Chicago relating to the enforcement operations that have been going on that have really been based on racial profiling and a Fourth Amendment violation. So I think the courts even though we don't know what's happening at the Supreme Court, they still remain really important to, I say, disrupt or muck up what's happening right now. Miguel, I wanted to see, I wanted to make sure we come back and maybe highlight again the point you were making about the role in migrant labor. You know, we heard Professor Zayas talk about some of the conditions that, that lead to people uh, leaving right their countries, and I know that's something that that's going to be covered a little bit in the, in the final panel. But, but I'm but I think your point about the role in the labor and the role as 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 source of cheap labor, even as it relates to Chicago. So if you could bring that back and even say something about that role here in Chicago. If you go about your daily life and you think, how many times do you come in contact with someone who is in what we would consider low wage work here, whether that be, you know someone bussing tables at a restaurant or in a hotel or something like that, you think about what does that population look like for the most part? And you can see, right, there are many, many immigrants who are in those positions. And many of them, right, have come here because we've asked them to come here in one way or another, whether that was they did come on a work visa and maybe overstayed, or they came here simply because there is a pressure that is felt of you know, the message you're hearing when you're in Mexico, when you're in Guatemala, when you're in Honduras is, there are jobs up there, they want you to come up there, right? And certainly here, I, I think it is th the ultimate hypocrisy of us to be allowing our society, in essence, to do these things where we're now stopping people and saying like, you know what, after all these years of relying on you to provide cheap food, cheap hotels, everything that makes the society here seem to make the economy run, now we're gonna detain you and say, well, you've done everything wrong, right? And I think it really is a matter of, you know, are we good consumers that way, right? Are we consumers that have the courage to ask the question when you go into a place? Are you willing to ask at, you know, a restaurant are you paying the people here? How do they get their tips? What happens with people? Or ask people, because a lot of that is this backdrop for this whole other issue of human trafficking. 
I can tell you, everybody in this room has come in contact with someone who's been trafficked. And there's a ton of it going on in all kinds of industries here in the city. And it's a money thing, and it comes back to that, that whole issue of who's benefiting, who's profiting from all of these policies that we have and how we're doing this. And I would say, in many ways, we gotta look in the mirror and say, well, we are, in a lot of ways, right? But I think most of us are willing to pay 10 cents more for an orange if that's really the cost of making sure that we have policies that are humane and treat people with dignity, so. And that's a great way to wrap up this particular panel. Tanya Cabrera from UIC, Claudia uh, Valenzuela is the Detention Project Director of the National Immigrant Justice Center, uh, Miguel Metropolitan Family Services, Swapna, as you know, um, is, is an attorney and is co-director of the Asylum Seeker Advocacy Project. Patricia, uh, Patricia is a professor here in Latino Latin American Studies, and Mary Meg McCarthy, uh, Executive Director with the Heartland uh, Alliance. So thank all of our panelists. So uh, we've had a couple more dignitaries join us. Uh, I did want to mention also when I introduced Rick Estrada that he's actually a former trustee of the University of Illinois. Uh, we've had uh, Maria Pesquera join us with the Healthy Communities Foundation. We acknowledged them earlier as one of the supporters, and we want to thank you so much for being here. Um, you're doing, you always have done awesome work. Um, and also Alma Anaya, um, uh, she's an alum of UIC and is also uh, soon to be Cook County Commissioner. So thank you also for being here, uh, Alma. I'm not sure where you went. You were here a second ago. Okay, and with that, we are ready to rock and roll. Okay, you guys are awesome. So in this next panel, what we wanted to do here is to emphasize the, the psychosocial impacts. And so most of the people on this panel have um, clinical uh, training, have degrees or an experience in doing clinical work around dealing with the social, psychosocial impacts of detention. So again, you've got um, in your program, you've got more detailed biographies of everybody, but Cindy Augustine, Jessica Boland, Rashma Shah, Yadida uh, Vieira, and Stephen Wine um, are going to be the presenters for this panel. So I'm going to start on that end, if you don't mind. As a pediatrician, uh, my goal is to help promote the health and well-being of all children. And as a developmental and behavioral pediatrician, I have the great privilege to work with children, their parents, families, um, and schools to help support a child's development. And I wanted to talk a little bit about why early childhood is so important, um, specifically as it relates to deportation and detention. Um, but first, I wanted uh, to read the words of Nobel laureate um, Gabrielle Mistral, um, because it resonates so well with what we have come here today to discuss. So she wrote, we are guilty of many errors and many faults, but our worst crime is abandoning the children neglecting the fountain of life. Many of the things we need can wait. The child cannot. Right now is the time his bones are being formed, his blood is being made, and his senses are being, to, are being developed. To him we cannot answer tomorrow. His name is today. Since the time these words were written, which was more than a half a century ago, we've learned so much about how important early childhood is to a child's well-being and future life course. Um, specifically, we know from studies um, in fields as diverse as economics, developmental psychology, um, neuroscience, that a child's everyday experiences and social environment are critical for shaping speech and language skills, social emotional development, and cognition. And because these early developmental skills are predictive of later um, economic, educational, emotional, and health outcomes, any negative impacts during this critical time can have profound health um, impacts. 
Uh, scientific evidence has also told us that when children experience stress and trauma, um, such as that associated with deportation and detention, or the fear of deportation and detention, um, it can have significant impacts on these early critical developmental skills. And scientists call this um, stress and trauma um, toxic stress. Um, and I know none of us came here for like a huge neuroscience lecture, but um, just briefly, it causes, the reason they call this toxic stress is because it causes this elevation in stress hormones that ultimately disrupts healthy brain development and can lead to um, disabilities in speech and language, learning, um, and mental health issues that range from anxiety to depression. Um, and so, um, you know, it, the, but the, these multidisciplinary studies have also shown us that there are things that we can do to prevent these negative impacts. Obviously, first and foremost is to prevent this stress or minimize the amount of stress um, these children are going through in the first place. Um, but the second is to also ensure the constant presence of their parents because a nurturing, stable relationship is critical uh, to support healthy development and to buffer the negative effects of toxic stress. Um, additionally, we can advocate for um, system level factors such as access to schools, food, health care, and mental health care, not just for children but for their parents as well, so we can support their ability to provide stability to their children. Um, and so, as Gabrielle Michel so eloquently wrote, um, to not um, address federal immigration policies and not advocate for protective safeguards is to really ignore everything that we know um, about childhood development and its importance for later health outcomes. Um, and also everything that we know as a, as a society is ethically and morally the correct thing to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Jessica Boland, and um, as you know, your program states, I'm the Director of Behavioral Health at Esperanza Health Centers, which is a federally qualified health care center here in Chicago. We are located on the southwest side of the city, so we are serving the communities of North and South Lawndale, Little Village, Pilsen, Brighton Park, Gage Park. And by serving those communities, we have a very high um, patient population of not only Latino um, patients and family, individuals and families, but we also have a very high percentage of persons that are here with undocumented status that are immigrants in one way or another. Um, at Esperanza, um, since we are seeing such a large percent of these immigrant per, um, persons, particularly those that are undocumented, um, we um, have kind of a front line, front row seat to the um, very profound effects that not only immigration status, but also the current climate that we're living in is having on both adults and on children. So I wanted to speak a little bit about what we've been seeing and then also what, um, as a healthcare provider, particularly mental health professionals, can do about it. Um, at Esperanza, we've been seeing a very high um, rate even before this current administration took office, right? Um, we know that immigrant um, persons, immigrant families, um, face adverse stress, much as my colleague to my right and others have spoken about already. We see um, intense rates of stress, chronic stress, uh, which are the result of um, immigration experience, what they may have experienced at the border. Sometimes persons are crossing more than one border on their way to the United States. Um, we see chronic stress as a result of poverty, um, you know, poverty from their home countries, of course, and then also the um, environments that they're living in um, and financial um, status that they have even once they're settled in the United States. And um, we also see a great deal of anxiety, depression, mood disorders, as we would call it in the mental health profession, um, related to those factors, as well as trauma. Trauma across the board, whether it's violence that they've experienced um, directly or that they've witnessed, both in their home countries and here. Um, it all interplays. Um, 
We also see um, those that are here um, who are childhood arrivals. So there are older persons now, maybe they've reached adulthood, but they have what we might call, what we call DACA status, um, or they're eligible for DACA status. The current immigration has made it very clear that they are targeting DACA. They would like to undo it. We've been fighting it. So far, things have maintained, um, a, you know, they've been stable. But on the ground, we are seeing so many individuals come to us with such uncertainty, such anxiety, and such fear about what their future holds in this country when they had so much hope, um, you know, before our current climate. After the 2016 presidential election, um, and then the early months of 2017, when we really saw a doubling down of this current immigration policy rhetoric around um, immigration, um, you know, this was the time when we had the the travel ban in place, and you know, there were many people getting detained at the airports, and um, there was a lot of chaos. And not that that's gotten a whole lot better, but this is when we really saw um, a really significant uptick in patients, both adults and children, presenting at our clinic with really, you know, striking mental health um, symptoms. Uh, you know, for instance, I'll never forget working with children. Um, it wasn't just once or twice, it was multiple times over and over, young elementary um, age children coming in with fears that, you know, Donald Trump is gonna take my mommy away. Um, we were hearing from the communities, the school, the neighborhood schools that we work with that, you know, teachers were, they had no idea what to do. They had students that were either outright missing class because they were so afraid to leave their homes or families were afraid to send their children out or that kids were unable to even focus or pay attention in class because they were just sitting all day long with fear that when they got home, their parents wouldn't be there. Um, because while many of our children have citizenship status because they were born here, um, their parents do not, and they are well aware of that, and they are well aware of the fact that their parents could be deported at any moment, or at least that's their perception. Um, among older youth, teenagers, again, young adults, we saw a lot of despair, a lot of hopelessness, a lot of kind of this giving up rhetoric. I, you know, personally worked with many teenagers, you know, high school and college age, um, you know, persons that, you know, were just kind of of this, you know, shoulder shrugging, giving up, why do I even bother? Why should I even go to school? Why should I study for this exam? It doesn't matter. I have no future here. Um, we also saw, you know, pretty severe depression symptoms, you know, related to that hopelessness. We saw high rates of suicidality, um, and, you know, we couldn't corroborate a whole lot of it, but there was a fair amount of rumors and reports of actual completed suicides that may or may not have been related to that felt hopelessness and despair about their future in this country. And we certainly know that exists for persons that are even facing real threats of deportation that are being held in detention. Um, you know, they just don't have any sense of hope about what might happen to them if they are in fact deported back to these home countries where they feel like they will most certainly meet a violent end. Um, across the community, you know, there's been a lot of um, fears about, you know, things like ICE raids. Um, we've seen, um, Thankfully, not too, too much, but you know, it's certainly present about people not wanting to even seek out health care, not even wanting to come to a clinic such as ours um, for fear of what may or may not happen to them by being registered in some capacity, right? Like being, by being registered as a patient at the clinic. Um, you know, uh, some of the colleagues on the first panel who are speaking about some of these uh, proposals that are coming down the pipeline to um, punish those that are seeking either residency status here, or citizenship status here, if they um, are to take part in government benefits such as Medicaid or food stamps or WIC. That is the bread and butter of our patients. They depend on these things. They cannot come to our clinic without, um, they can't function in society without these things, right? Even if adults don't qualify for health care insurance because of their immigration status, their children do. And so it's really, really frightening to think about the possible ripple effects that might occur if this policy does, in fact, come to play, or even just simply the threat of it. Even if it never becomes an actual policy, the fact that it's out there like a specter is going to absolutely cause pe persons to delay seeking health care, whether it's mental health care, which they absolutely need, and even 
physical health care, such as just, you know, annual well, well child pediatric um, exams. Adults will absolutely put off coming to the doctor because they have no idea what effect that's going to have on their families um, and their potential for seeking actual permanent residency status here in this country in some way. So what can we do? Well, we need to maintain you know, vigilance. We need to be out there. We need to be outspoken, strong advocates for these people. They have no voice. We have a little bit more of a voice than they do. At Esperanza, we've made it very clear that you know, we do not cooperate with immigration um, officials in any way unless compelled to do so with a judicial warrant. Um, we have really partnered with community organizations um, such as um, immigration uh, uh, law organizations like Latinos Progresando to hold um, community events, community forums, really educating people on their rights, um, what they can and can do, how to make safety plans for their families, um, and also really making sure that we have trauma-informed care both among our mental health clinicians and our health clinic clinicians, or really anybody who's interacting with um, the patients at our clinic in any way. It's so important that we understand their experiences and the impacts that all of this have on them in order to provide them with care and help them heal and maintain productive lives. Um, so I think I will- Thank you, Jessica. Pass it along. Great, yeah, thank you. Hello everyone, I really want to thank you for uh, being here. It really, as a community member, it means a lot to have so many people interested in this issue. I'll speak on, I'm a child development specialist, but I'll speak on the project that I've been working on um, with uh, Dr. Wine from UIC. I've been uh, serving the community of Brighton Park for several years now in um, particular with Immaculate Conception Parish, which is in the south side of Chicago. We have, uh, we partnered with Dr. Wine and UIC to provide a low intensity cognitive behavioral therapy to families experiencing distress, anxiety, depression, not just because of the community violence that they're experiencing in the last few years, but also because of all the immigration trauma that's going on. Uh, we have been implementing a four-week session uh, series that focuses on how to not just address uh, mental health stigma within our communities, but also how to deal with common mental health disorders. And we've had a very successful several months because um, our families need the space to be able to process a lot of these um, the anxiety, the depression, and also the stress, the fear. Uh, we've had many families who came to us with the hope of receiving services because in our communities, there's very, if at all, any mental health services that are culturally sensitive and that are provided in the language that our families speak. Uh, one, one story that I can share is that one of our families prior to the 2016 election, they would use the, the comment of like, oh, I won't, I'll, I'll drive at the speed limit so I don't get pulled over and then deported. And it was very, it was used loosely. And after the, the election, they made a comment like that and their youngest child was like, started crying in the car because family separation is real and it's happening. We've seen it all over the media. Um, We've also had families who, like within this space, have opened up about their own immigration stories. And for them, it, just watching families getting separated, thinking about what they left behind, and it's, it's been worth it completely, but also seeing that their own immigration status is subjecting their children to trauma, and that the children did not, did not pick that but because their parents decided to come to this country for a better opportunity. Now their children are subjected to the stress and their teens are conflicted because they don't wanna go back to their parents' country because they have better resources here, but the parents are now looking at a family plan in terms of what do we do if we end up getting deported? Uh, for us, it's been a very successful experience. Uh, we've noticed that the, these families need the space. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's particularly because um, 
within the church, we know that families, when they're struggling, um, they rely on the clergy. And right now, the church is experiencing a, a demand in terms of meeting the needs of our families in a very psychosocial manner um, that we cannot meet on our own, which is why we've partnered with Dr. Wine and uh, UIC to be able to provide these resources to families in a way where they feel safe. Just getting families to disclose a little bit about their status has been a challenge, but once we um, provide the space that's being led by community members that they can trust, uh, it's, it's been a beautiful experience, and I always leave the room feeling so honored that these families have shared so much of their lives in, in a space and that they have to go back home and deal with it on their own because we don't have the resources in the community. Thank you so much, Arida. Good morning, everyone. My name is Cindy Agustin, um, and I'm here to speak from the community perspective, uh, both as someone who has done organizing advocacy within the undocumented community, particularly the undocumented youth, um, community and also as someone who is undocumented um, currently under the DACA program. Um, and so I appreciate actually what my colleague just shared about creating those spaces for community where you can heal, come together and share um, for many of us who are undocumented or who are experiencing immigration situations right now, something that's very personal. Um, I uh, began organizing in 2010 with the Immigrant Youth Justice League, the first undocumented-led organization in Chicago. And one of the beautiful things that came out of that organizing was that we, uh, as undocumented young people, we were able to create a space just for us as undocumented where we were able to share our stories, share our struggles, but build community, um, right? And, and in that community, be able to empower ourselves, be able to build power together and advocate for ourselves at different levels, at the school level, at the city level, at the state level, and at the federal level. Um, but also, uh, right, um, growing uh, our, our support group. Uh, the Immigrant Youth Justice League is now uh, the Organized Communities Against Deportations, and uh, they host uh, bi-weekly uh, assembleas, where they bring community members, specifically families who are currently experiencing de uh, deportation um, or new, newly arrived families, and they're able to create that space that's intergenerational, not just young people, but children who just arrived, families, parents, grandparents who are all experiencing the effects of current immigration policy. So as we think about the interventions, how do we support immigrant communities, it's important that we think about how do we support to create those spaces. Um, I'm going to push back on a comment earlier about us not having a voice. We have a voice. I think it's about creating those spaces where we are able to get our voices out there in different ways, um, whether it is through advocacy and calling our elected officials, asking them to support or not support legislation that's out there, or if it's just creating that space where you can build community and you don't feel alone. I think after the 2016 elections, it's been very difficult to be able to come out and say that you are undocumented because there are constant reports of ICE coming to, uh, to your neighborhood at the local McDonald's in Pilsen or you know, down the street at the, you know, the mall um, or the store, whatever it may be. And so th that fear is real, but if you know that there are other people out there who are there to support you and who can relate to you, um, that creates power. Um, and so as we're thinking about right, any interventions, thinking of any, um, any programs that we want to implement in our communities, again, it's important to think about the community and what it is that they need. Um, I think it's also just very important to not generalize the immigrant experience. The immigrant experience varies based on each, indiv on each individual. It varies on when you arrive to the United States. As someone who came here as a child in the early 90s and crossed that border, my experience is very different than those who are crossing the border right now. That does not mean that I'm not, you know, 20 whatever years later, I'm not experiencing a lot of the things that we've talked about already. But that also means that my experience, again, has been different. I didn't have to go to court. I wasn't in deportation proceedings. I'm not in deportation proceedings. However, we have now three-year-olds who have to represent themselves in court by themselves. And so as we're thinking about interventions, as we're thinking about supporting our, our young people, supporting our families, think about what are their specific needs for that specific community based on their, uh, based on their background. Um, 
and also for our nonprofit in, nonprofits out there, our institutions. Again, right, not generalizing that experience. I work mainly with undocumented young people, and I've been meeting more and more young people who are not DACA eligible, who are not eligible for a work permit, who are not eligible to, for many of the scholarships that a lot of the institutions offer because they're not they don't have DACA, but they still deserve an opportunity to pursue their dreams, to go to college, be able to find opportunities for work, right? And so how do we as institutions, as organizations, push ourselves so that it's not just about supporting the good immigrant, supporting the deserving immigrant, but supporting all immigrants. Um, and so I hope that many of you, especially our advocates, especially those who are leading these organizations, think about ways to really create a space for our communities where they feel safe and where their voices are heard and where they're the ones leading, um, right? It's important that we don't look at immigrant communities as research su subjects, but rather as advocates for them advocating for themselves and taking the space for them to decide what is needed in their community. See if you can follow that act, Dr. Wine. <laughs> I'm not going to try. In the wake of the zero tolerance policy, um, the following was written by Masha Gessen in The New Yorker. Quote, the American government has unleashed terror on immigrants and in doing so has naturally reached for the most effective tools. Taking children from their families and holding them hostage is a tried and true instrument of totalitarian terror. And I guess I'd say as a terror, uh, terrorism and migration researcher, I really uh, can't disagree, you know, that the U.S. government has taken the um, systematic mass neglect of immigrants' human rights to a whole new level by um, deliberately tearing apart children from parents. You know, you spoke of how important parents are as a protective resource, so in the midst of trauma upon trauma upon trauma, as Louise says, when you then take away their parents, come on. Um, um, and not only are you doing a grave impact to those young people and families, but you're then um, deliberately spreading widespread fears nationally and globally to all uh, immigrants that this too can happen to you. Um, I mean, that's what terrorism is. Um, it's not only the damage you do to individuals, but it's the symbolic and emotional damage you do to, um, to a wide array of persons throughout society. So um, I don't want to give in to hyperbole, but I seriously can't convince myself that that's not state-sponsored terrorism. Um, I don't believe that the policy is likely to succeed as a deterrent of immigration, uh, partly because of what Luis said that um, the, the traumas and desperation is so bad uh, in the places that they're coming from that how much worse can this be um, must be the calculation of, of many folks and also because of the economic um, drivers behind migration that we also heard about. However, um, I have no doubt that this so-called zero tolerance policy you know, is having a mass, um, really destructive impact on damaging youth and families and, and further spreading fear. Um, um, I don't think that we should um, be distracted, as many speakers have said, by just focusing on this particular cruel policy from all the other dimensions of it. There are, there's no, as, as you just said, less person, Cynthia, there's no one uh, prototype uh, and pathway uh, through this horror for um, immigrant youth and, and families. And Luis Zayas has done some great research where he's distinguished between the citizen children, the orphans, the exiles, uh, mixed status families, um, and indeed we have to pay attention to those complexities because um, the, the problem is multidimensional, and the policy remedies and practice solutions are also multidimensional. Multi and um, that's why we need research, you know, because um, it's really appalling. It's really appalling. You know, we have some 3 million 
um, people who were deported, say, between 2008 and 2015. And, and uh, I mean, huge number of lives um, changed in huge numbers of countries. Um, some of those people will be coming back to the US. And what do we know about them? What do we know about what has been done to them? Um, what do we know about their resources? What do we know about their families and communities? Very little. If you search on the NIH reporter today and, and look for uh, research on deportation, um, you don't see Luis studies yet because his, his is probably about to be funded, we hope. But you see one by uh, Ana Martinez Donate from Drexel University on health and well-being of US children of, de of deported migrants which is a two-year study studying 50 children. 50, okay, it's, I'm, I think it's fantastic that she managed to get this funded, but, um, but um, what we're talking about is we need knowledge, we need scientific-based knowledge to inform po uh, smart humanistic policy decisions um, and also to drive uh, practice solutions. Um, let me digress for a moment, and for those of you who aren't um, mental health clinicians or neuroscientists, um, what do we know about what, um, what damage um, these kinds of early life traumas do to, to kids? Um, the concept of biological embeddedness um, has been articulated um, um, and demonstrated across study and study and study in many different populations of how traumatic experiences get under your skin. They change brain function, they change brain structure, they lead to higher rates of mental illness, they lead to cognitive um, disabilities, um, higher rates of chronic illness like diabetes, cancer, heart disease, also substance abuse, drug abuse, lower educational performance, lower job performance. This is not opinion. This is scientific fact based on amazing studies which have been done looking um, like 30, 40, 50 years later, longitudinal studies following these cohorts, what's happened to them. For example, a lot of great studies were done in Finland where they looked at children who were, who were separated from their parents in the context of World War II. They have statistically much higher rates of depression than do those who weren't separated. And interestingly enough, even the much higher rates of depression than those whose father went to serve in the army, um, which makes me draw the analogy between the voluntary family separation of a labor migrant um, versus the forced separation of, of, um, of these kinds of policies. And I remember what, um, what many refugee kids have said to me is the equivalent of don't ever underestimate uh, the, the incredibly destructive impact of being forced to leave your home, being forced to lose your family. Uh, and so um, there's a big difference between forced and voluntary. So um, I just want to hit one or two more points here. Um, I think that what kind of, re I want to say a few words about what kind of research we need. Um, I think that here are some of the questions that are out there that I think build on the kind of amazing stuff that Luis and others have done. One is, why are these migrants coming to the U.S.? I mean, um, what numbers of them have experienced threats and traumas in their home countries, and how many really would qualify for some kind of protected status? versus being um, economic migrants. I think it's a high number. And again, I don't think that there's any one type of, of, of migrant here. Another is, um, you know, what exactly is happening in these detention facilities? And what are the roles and ethics of mental health and health professionals? Sadly, I don't think people like me are ever going to get to investigate that. I think that's the job of whistleblowers and investigative reporters and maybe some crafty attorneys to, to to try to uh, get inside of there. I believe eventually the stories will be told, just like the stories that were told in Abu Ghraib and places like that, the role of mental health professionals and torture. Um, what happens in the short and long term to vulnerable child migrants when you deprive them of their most protective resource, their parents, their families? This is a very 
terrible but um, unavoidable question. Um, on the other hand, um, I'm not a big fan of research which just shows that um, all these things are bad for people. I think that we need research that points the way towards um, helpful practices, that shines a light on what families can do on the resilience of families. Families are one of the great resources of, um, of Latinos, and, um, and I would not underestimate the strength of those families. So we need to also understand how can families, both locally and transnationally, reorganize and redeploy and draw upon their resilience to offer support post-detention and post-deportation. Um, and that's, um, that's something that uh, underlies the project that um, Yadira and, and I and others are doing, which is a belief that uh, these families know how to take care of themselves. They know they love each other, they know how to support each other, but they're in extreme situations, so they need a little extra help. But why not leverage off of the strength of those families and the strength of the church that, that, uh, that is their safe space? Um, so that leads me to the last question. How can communities, schools, NGOs, and governments um, and, and community clinics offer services to help the recovery and reintegration of the impacted um, migrant youth and families? Um, I don't think any of us are going to get into those detention facilities to work there. Um, I think that's too, uh, too much of a controlled space. Um, though that's, I would like to see something happen there too. But I think, so post there, what can we do? Um, I'm so glad that people come to see you at your, your clinic and that you're helping them. But um, on the other hand, I recognize that the vast majority of people who need those services will never walk in, will never encounter a mental health professional. Um, and so it comes to primary care professionals or churches or other kind of spaces or lawyers um, to offer psychosocial and mental health support. And there we can leverage off of the, the, um, the, the most effective uh, mechanism of, of global health um, from the Center for Global Health, Damiano from the Center for Global Health, which is task sharing, which is don't depend upon um, high-priced uh, uh, professionals to provide services to people. Instead, build the capacities of a non-health professional, non-mental health professional to be able to teach people how to manage their own symptoms, how to empower themselves, how to connect, how to access resources. That's what we're trying to do in the church, but that's just one small example of, I think, uh, what needs to be done. And think about where all these kids are gonna go. Um, some are gonna go all over the U.S., some are gonna go back to their home country, some are gonna go to some third country. If, um, try to wrap your head around that. How, uh, how can community resources um, be mobilized to try to address their needs. That's what I'm thinking about. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. and it's that passion and commitment that has been a real driving force in this event. So thank you very much, um, Dr. Wine. So we might have time for one question, perhaps. And again, we've got mics over here. So uh, Elizabeth, we've got a, a somewhat gentleman right here who's ready to ask a question. Um, you know, one of the things that, that's really clear here, right here, up here, uh, that's really clear too in everything that I think this that was just said in this panel and in, in the previous panel is all the different actors that are important to this. I think Swapna was really passionate about saying that, and I also, and others of you, right, that all, from all these different angles and all these different perspectives, right, that we, that we really need to be fighting this together. Um, go ahead, sir. Hello. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for sharing all um, these um, the information. Uh, so I kind of had to two questions, but they were really quick. So one mm -hmm. of them was regarding, um, this is for Jessica, uh, like for mi mixed family status, and have you seen that um, the documented citizens in those families are even um, kind of worried and scared to even receive mental health or any type of health for themselves, not even just for their own families, just based off of the information they have to give uh, regarding like maybe family history or what have you, do they feel more hesitant at that? And my second question is, um, I think it's great that we're using like community, um, like basically like faith-based organizations to help, but uh, this is for everyone, but are these like um, type of implementations being done at schools basically to kind of hit the, through, through the children, you're kind of um, 
tapping into the family even a lot easier than waiting for the parents to make the first move? Um, to your first point about our question asking about, you know, families with mixed status and if persons who actually do have documented status are, you know, feeling effects or delaying, um, you know, health care. Um, I did want to clarify that our center, we offer behavioral health services, but we're a primary care center. So um, we see, you know, pediatrics, we see family medicine, we see women's health, OBGYN. And um, I, you know, can't give you specific stats, um, of course, but I would say anecdotally, absolutely, I think we've definitely seen um, hesitation across the board, no matter what your immigration status is, um, in terms of, you know, wanting to withhold information or just concerns about what might happen to that information in the future. And I can answer your question about um, having resources for students in the schools. Ideally, I mean, it would be great to have that available to students. Um, our model is focused on the entire family, and that's actually one of the challenges that we encountered because getting the whole family to come in on a Wednesday evening is really difficult, especially because we have parents who work two jobs or students are playing sports, doing homework. Um, it's also been hard um, reaching these teens because they don't know how to process a lot of what's going on at home. In the, in the classroom, at school, it would be great, but we don't, what's the number of social workers or psychologists in, this, in the schools? Very few. And oftentimes, they're the ones dealing with behaviors that are disruptive in the classroom. A child who is depressed may not be disruptive in the classroom. They'll be the quiet one. So I, identifying those kind of behaviors is difficult because they're not talking about them, but also they may not be disrupting the classroom. And, so that's when they get overlooked. Uh, and I think that's one of the main um, goals of our project, to getting these teens to talk about the issues with their families uh, after going through our sessions and dealing with how to keep get um, going, keep doing, which focuses on how to deal with depression and how to, or even grounding when dealing with PTSD. Uh, so again, we're starting from a church based because we know that the, the, their needs are not being met in the classroom or in any school. Thank you so much, panelists. Rashma Shah with the uh, Behavioral Pediatrics, Department of Pediatrics, University of California, I mean, University of, of Illinois, Chicago, Steve Wine, Cindy Augustine. Mm -hmm. Um, can I just ask? Yes, you can, one Jessica thing? and Yadira. Go ahead. Can I just please add one thing? Um, just speaking on behalf of uh, the church as a church member, um, and um, like the Catholic Church uh, emphasizes Catholic social teaching, and I'll focus on two of the themes. Um, so we we focus on the family. Um, Catholic social, social teaching teaching focuses on the poor and the vulnerable. The, the church should stand together with the poor and the vulnerable. And the family as a unit is precious and it's valuable and it should be maintained together. That's one. And two, institutions of any sort should be held or measured in the way that they threaten or enhance life of every person. And I don't, it, you don't have to be Catholic to believe that, but Right now, the, this administration is threaten, the, threatening the lives of every single one of these families. And we, researchers, clinicians, um, social workers, anyone who is in the community, we need to hold this administration accountable and we can't let this trauma continue. Thank you. Joshua, that's a great, thank you so much. That's a great way to end it. Well, thank you, great, great panel. We have Dagmara Avela, Jose Bravo, Oscar Chacon, Virginia Martinez, Dana Roosh, and again, Luis Zayas. So um, as, well, to mix things up a little bit, how about if we start on this end this oh. time? Right? Yeah. Okay. I'm Virginia Martinez. Um, I'm an attorney, but I don't practice immigration law. However, uh, over the past two years, I have gone down to the Dilly Detention Center um, that Dr. Zayas mentioned and showed pictures of. Um, I've gone down eight times, and the last time was earlier this month. Um, and I think when we talk about what should be done, what are the policy recommendations, there's the political. We have to start from the top and abolish ICE, or as Mary Meg said, defund ICE. Um, 
And if, short of that, it's at least trying to make changes within it so that it's not so anti-immigrant. It clearly has become totally anti-immigrant rather than processing, listening to, and um, managing immigrant issues, immigration issues. Um, part of the reason that I decided to continue to keep going down and volunteering is hearing the stories that the women told about the Yeleras and the Perreras. Um, they are inhumane. Um, immediately what should be done is to change um, the way uh, the environment is within those holding cells. The freezing cold, one woman told me she took off her blouse and wrapped her baby in it and put her baby between her legs because her baby was turning blue. Um, providing basic human needs. Another woman told me that she had her period and she asked um, one of the guards for sanitary napkins and they just said, nope, get away. Um, and she eventually had to use a diaper that one of the other moms happened to have with her. Um, it's just so dehumanizing. Women are kicked in the morning to wake them up. Children are kicked to wake them up. Um, and they're just not even, in the Yeleras, not even provided with a, a mattress or a mat to sleep on, so they're just on the cement. Um, it, and because of the cold, they're brought in sometimes having crossed the river, so they are wet and they are uh, not given any clothing to change, their, their, their own clothing they might have brought with them is taken away, so they are freezing there, wet in um, this 50 degree weather, uh, or air conditioning. And if the children cry, the air conditioning is turned up. Um, so it's trying to change that whole environment, which is really cruelty um, towards these families. Um, some of the other things I think that need to be done is not to extend the length of detention, which is what the, the administration is currently trying to do. Shut down the for-profit centers. Um, as we heard at one of the earlier panels, you have to follow the money, and you know why there's um, this effort to detain even more uh, families in these centers, individuals and families, and ensure appropriate uh, mental and physical health services. So there are mental health services at Dilly. However, um, people change. You know, it's like on a rotating basis that people go there. And one of the women went um, for help. Uh, they have all suffered trauma, trauma from their own countries, trauma. Many of the women have been raped on the way. And then the trauma of the crossing and the way they were treated at the Yeleras and Berreras. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, they, I don't know, we don't know the level of the person that, that said this. We don't know if it was a psychologist or soci uh, um, social worker. We don't know what the person was. But the mental health person told this woman, it's your fault that you're here. You don't qualify. She told them why she had, was applying for asylum, which they shouldn't even get into a legal discussion about the person's basis for asylum, but they did. And just said, it's your fault that you're here. You don't even qualify for asylum. So victim blaming by a mental health person is just, I mean, it's a malpractice, actually. Um, uh, and providing um, proper and legal due process. So women are being stopped, families, men and women, families are being stopped on the bridge and not allowed to step onto U.S territory in order to seek asylum. They're just told, there is no asylum in the US anymore, go back, or we will call Mexican immigration, which is a huge, huge threat. They are more afraid of Mexican immigration than they are of US immigration. And in fact, sometimes one of the women told me she was at the middle of the bridge and immigration just motioned for the Mexican immigration officer to take her away. And they, they did, and uh, he just walked her a few blocks and saw her, how young her child was and, she, and just told her, find another way to get in and let her go. But some are held and deported from Mexico back to their countries of origin. Um, and uh, you know, bottom line is we should be abiding by our own laws as well as international law, and that is not happening right now. 
Um, at the local level, I mean, in terms of the more general um, issues affecting immigrants and the immigrant community, mental health services should be available throughout the country um, to, to provide services to any immigrant families that need them. And, you know, given the, the lack of services, I think that there needs to be training um, of school personnel, of CBO staff, of everybody who comes in contact with families to ensure that they can recognize the need, have resources to refer them to, and can help them, um, and that it doesn't just fall on the uh, families to go seek out mental health services. So can, can those we, are my Thank you. Thank general. you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dagmara Avalar, and as mentioned, I work with the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights. Um, our organization mostly focuses on policy changes at the federal, state, and local levels. And in the 31 years um, that we have, we have not seen this level of violence, and I like to bold and stress that and italicize it. We have not seen this level of violence um, by the federal government against immigrants and refugees. The attacks have ranged from uh, the Muslim ban in 2017 to the increased rates, including one that happened in Illinois in May, where 53% of the people detained were, and I hate to say this word, quote unquote collateral, meaning that they just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time to most recently the zero, uh, zero tolerance policy practiced at the southern border and that have left thousands of children separated from their families. This does make you wonder, is it possible to resist and to persist in Trump's America? As my fellow panelists have mentioned, um, the trauma faced by children and their parents is great, uh, but do know that family separation is not new. This is not a new issue. It has been happening for years. Um, as an immigrant, I arrived here at the age of 12, 12 from Ecuador, and I remember vividly the day that my mom came home crying because one of her coworkers told her that she was going to call immigration on her if she was not, uh, she didn't do as she was told. I remember that my sister and I could not sleep for two weeks. And the only thing that we could think about in school was, will this be the day that we won't get to see our mother? So when I say that this is not new, believe me, it's, it's not new. And yes, my experience, and, and just like somebody else mentioned, our experience coming to the US was different because I came here in 1999. Um, and this does not happen in the border. It does speak to the trauma faced by immigrant children and US citizen children as well who, um, it, who are thinking about what day they're going to be separated from their families. So when we talk about strategies, um, we do have to be cognizant also of our political reality. Strategies that might have worked previously may not be as effective anymore, right? We just saw a, a, a hearing, quite an interesting hearing yesterday, right? Where if this would have happened in a different administration, we already know that probably this person would not even be considered to be um, to take a seat in the Supreme Court. So yes, we are working with a different political reality. Um, as organizations, we do have to, and, and as individuals, um, our responsibility is to continue to organize and to hold our elected officials accountable. This has been mentioned previously as well. The administration has been able to change policies and put people um, in positions of power who are known anti-immigrants, such as Jeff Sessions. We need to continue to push for the passage of laws and policies that address the migrant children's best interest and that safeguards their rights, especially when going through deportation proceedings. To address the problem for those who are already in the system, it is important that access to legal and mental health providers is a priority. Um, you might not know this, um, and I'm not sure if this was mentioned previously, but when it comes to immigration proceedings, individuals are not provided with an immigration attorney. So here we have seen uh, various reports of children going to immigration uh, and to defend their case on their own, right? This is not right. 
According to a study by Syracuse University, a child who doesn't have a lawyer is four times more likely to receive a removal order, uh, also known as a deportation, than a child who does. So when we talk about strategies, um, it is important that we push for access, uh, access to representation for minors and their parents. And it's also important that we demand for special judges for children, okay? And that, that we have also policies that address their best interests. Thank you. Thank you. Jose? Thank you. I'll say good morning, because it's still good morning in California. <laughs> and here, too. <laughs> and here, too, yes. So um, I'm a, I've been a community organizer for about 30 years. And um, I'd rather be wearing a guayabera than a suit. <laughs> but here we are. Um, so I came to this country when I was five years old. My parents were farm workers in San Diego County. I live in San Diego County. I was born across the way in Tijuana, where everybody in my school, in my generation, their parents actually crossed back into Mexico to have children because they didn't understand the language, because it was too expensive. And ultimately, most of my graduating class from high school were born in Tijuana or the border region. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, but I just want to say that I remember my father was a caretaker of a 500-acre avocado ranch. And there was a guy named Johnny that would come to talk to my father. Johnny was actually the sector chief of immigration and border patrol. And he would tell my father, he would say, Jose, um, we're going to be checking this side of the ranch, so put your people on this side of the ranch. That doesn't happen anymore, of course. But that was the relationship at some point that we had with folks from INS, that some of those people did understand the reality of why people were coming this way. And a lot of them were more of an understanding that folks weren't coming here to create chaos. Folks were coming here for a better life and in some instances to feed people, right, in the fields. So it's been really interesting. I travel out of San Diego and lately I've been seeing white vans just parked at the airport and they have a mesh. And I can't see in, but I stop there. And the, and the ICE officers look at me and say like, and, and I say very gently, I say to people, los queremos y no se desesperen, aquí estamos. Sometimes I hear a thank you, a gracias, but sometimes I hear nothing. That's the reality that's happening, right? And to me, it's, it's something that I see on a daily basis on the Mexico-US border. You know, I've, I've been crossed by the border all my life. And ultimately, uh, that's our way of life. I moved back to the United States about three years ago because rents were too high in San Diego. Um, so we've been having, I've been asked to be a, a non-paid consultant to, to the new administration in Mexico, Morena. And part of what we've been talking about is the fact that the US, the Mexican, Estados Unidos de Mexico, does not have the moral standing to be criticizing US uh, immigration policy with the trajectory, the legacy, and the history that it has in Mexico against immigrants themselves. So we did get some commitments um, in Las Consultas Populares from the new administration that they will keep uh, the commitment at the consulados for DACA recipients and pay the DACA documentation. The other piece that they want to commit to and we're pushing on 
but they don't know necessarily how, is that money moves things here in the United States. And we're saying, hey, if the United States can put an embargo on Cuba, if it can put an embargo on Venezuela, why can't the U.S., the Mexican state, being the number one trade partner with the United States, put an embargo on the United States for human rights violations? Why not? You have to start hitting them where it hurts. And a lot of times it is in that pocketbook. And for Mexico just put two, two um, not an embargo, but they put a tariff on two things. I don't know if folks understand what two things. Whiskey, so whiskey coming into Mexico has a big giant tariff now. And cheese from your neighboring state. Why? Because, and see, this is interesting. I thought it, they just did it just to mess with people. But no, the reason why is because those politicians in Kentucky and Minnesota have very bad immigrant views. Wisconsin, sorry. <laughs> Cheese heads, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so they have very bad immigrant views. So in, in a way, indirectly, the Mexican government is pushing, but they have to do more. I think there's another piece that, that is very important too, is that there's also people that have been deported from Mexico that are US citizens, that are in Michoacan, that are in the different states, that are in the different countries. And those people, in many instances, don't know Spanish. The children don't know Spanish. They don't know that deeply about their culture in order to come back into a culture and be immersed in that. So I think one of the things that we would like to do is push on institutions like this university to start some kind of via online, online internet schools back into Mexico to have them understand what they already know and learn what they need to learn. And I think that's very, very important because if not, then those children will be multiply victimized for their whole life, right? And in essence, in Mexico, if you speak English and you're not educated, you're gonna go to work for somebody. And that, that um, job market is probably not the right job market that you wanna be in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Dana. Morning, everyone. Thanks for hanging in there. This is a long morning. Um, I'm on faculty in the Department of Psychiatry here at UIC, so I'm going to be speaking to you kind of from my perspective as both a researcher and a clinician, but I really am hoping to use my voice to shed light on the experiences of those directly impacted by these policies. So it really is through my work with kids and families, UIC students, community ad advocates that I hope I can speak um, clearly um, about the urgency of these issues. <coughs> So I want to first highlight, most of the panelists have talked about the importance of putting this into the context of global migration. So that really requires us to understand both the push and the pull factors. And so when we talk about solutions or strategies moving forward, we really need to base them on the tenet that seeking asylum is an international law and a human right, period. Um, and I also want to point out that if we like just widen the lens a little bit to think about migration, it's a trans-species phenomena, right? So the natural gradient is for every living thing to move from environments that threaten safety and survival to those environments that increase the likelihood of safety and survival, right? But now we're in the most, we're in a global crisis of forced human migration. And so when we think about um, current detention policies um, and practices here in the US, they not only criminalize asylum seeking, but they fundamentally disregard the human right to seek safety and environments in which we can thrive. The for-profit detention system here has irrefutable negative psychological consequences that have already been talked a lot about today. Um, but I do wanna mention there are policy briefs put forth by both national groups like the National Immigrant Justice Center of Heartland Alliance, and also kind of more global strategies by the UNHCR 
that talk about more humanitarian humanitarian best practice alternatives to detention. So these are community-based alternatives that include kind of some key, some key strategies, um, elements of case management, and referrals to community support services while providing monitoring and supervision during the determination process, okay? Um, these are community-based alternatives that are permitted under current law. And we've actually seen some case examples in cities and municipalities of these working well. Um, but they're not options that are currently put in place by ICE. Um, a 2016 report by USCIS reported that nearly four out of five families screened in detention reported a credible fear of returning to their home country, four out of five. But another um, American Immigration Council um, report cited that 14%, only 14% of detained immigrants acquire legal counsel, 14% compared to 66% of those not in detention. So I really want us to think about these policies place individuals and families who are already contending with insurmountable mental health risk factors in a context that increases psychological distress, but inherently denies them access to legal and social services that would judiciously determine their cases. Um, I also, it's been mentioned quite a bit this morning that there's a growing research um, on what the constant fear of deportation does to the daily life of many immigrant families and communities. Um, a recent policy report put forth by the Society for Community Research and Action, on which I'm a co-author, as well as another UIC faculty member, Dr. <laughs> um, Suarez um, Balcazar. I mean, also two other UIC alums are on that report, so UIC is um, doing a great job. Um, but that really highlighted what do we know from the literature about the effects of deportation on families and communities. And this report included alternatives to detention. Um, so not only kind of policy level and judicial practices, but really highlighted the role of community level, systems level strategies and solutions. So for example, some of my work here in Chicago and my research, I really focus on what are the roles of community-based organizations in helping to promote family mental health advocacy interventions. These are really critical settings for immigrant and refugee families. And I can speak at length, we don't have time for it this morning, about the mental health um, literature and the impact of these policies on immigrant families. But I'm gonna just boil it down to a, a real um, a, a takeaway message. So the experiences of many families are shaped, indelibly shaped by the pressures to live outside of the radar of detection. And so this has created a public mental health crisis um, for not only our immigrant communities, but other marginalized communities that kind of receive the similar message that at best, your experiences don't matter. They're constantly kind of disregarded by inequitable practices and policies, but worst yet, they're not deemed worthy of justice. Um, Again, many people mentioned today family, practice, uh, family detention practices and separations are not new, and we cannot overlook the shared hemispheric history that has put us in the current climate now at our southern border and, and abroad. Um, we face persistent wave of policies that undermine the mental health and well-being of our immigrant and refugee communities, so from the rescinding of DACA, the ending of TPS, um, so TPS terminations, threatening um, different ch you know, changes to public charge, the lowest refugee ceiling has been proposed for fiscal year um, 19. This is just to name a few. So when we think about solutions moving forward, um, we really need to focus on community-driven solutions um, that not only mitigate risk and protect our communities, but also aim to empower those directly affected by these policies. Thank you. Thank you. Luis. Thank you. Um, I won't speak too long. You've heard enough from me. But give my, Mr. Chacon more time. Uh, I would just say, I'll, I'll make a few points. I'm sure you would. Um, make a few points. One is, is about science and the need for continuing research. We need to build our knowledge. We need to build the knowledge on, for developmental science, for neuroscience, for social science, to understand what happens when people migrate, when they're detained, when they're deported, and so on. We just need that knowledge. More so, I think, we need that knowledge to use it in legal action. We need to be able to cite the, the literature that shows the damage that's done to families and to children specifically when we're arguing cases. And I've tried to do that in the affidavit declarations that I've, been, uh, I've written for, for cases because that, that is compelling. You cannot argue when you have good science. 
uh, it's helpful for court testimony as well. When you're testifying or writing a report before, uh, 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 in, in a case of some kind, I think that's really vital. So for that reason, we need to continue doing this research. I'll leave it to Dr. Wine to address the issues of intervention research, but at least uh, my area is kind of getting this basic research to really um, document what's happening to people. The other is to, is to convert that knowledge into practical solutions and digestible morsels for legislatures. Uh, legislators don't pay a lot of attention to the numbers, but if you, get, if you give them something that they can latch on to, maybe three points in a testimony, you're apt to, to have a greater impact than if you cite uh, statistics and numbers and coefficients, it doesn't work. So we need to use science and break it down so that the average citizen will understand. And, and uh, uh, the legislators will understand it, but then we have to consider the, the public education that we need to use that data for, to be able to speak to public audiences and tell them what, what uh, we're finding. And um, finally, I'd like to refer back to you know, uh, Virginia Martinez's comments about what are we going to do with these detention centers? How do we, how do we handle refugees in a more humane way? That has to, that has to happen. When I, was, when I would go to Carnes or Dilly, the, the thought was, well, they, they, um, these mothers and children are, are a threat to our security. Really? Really? Moms with three kids. Or that they were a flight risk. Really? Try walking 200 yards with two kids or three kids, and who has to pee first? <laughs> or who's complaining that the sibling is looking at her or whatever? You know, no moms, <laughs> they're not going to flee. I think we have to find better ways. If we, if we have to hold people at the border, there have to be better ways of doing it rather than this inhumane uh, uh, process. Just back a moment to the issue of using science for the purposes of advocacy. In Texas, uh, the Dilly and Carnes uh, applied for licenses as child care centers. <laughs> And we fought them. Uh, we fought them in the court, and we won. Uh, grassroots leadership was the organization that led the way. I testified in that trial, or in that, in that case, because they wanted to be uh, licensed daycare centers uh, when they were really actually detention centers, of course. And that, we've got to stop that at the local level. What changes can we make? Unfortunately, uh, the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services was influenced by the then Obama administration to, to cut corners on, on the kinds of um, uh, regulations that we have for children in any congregate care situation so that we would be able to have more than four children in a room in a smaller space than we would act, uh, expect in a, in, a, in a residential treatment facility or that maybe there would be mixed genders at a, when, when in fact we separate genders out at a certain age and that children uh, who would um, could live in, same, in rooms with uh, unrelated adults. This is the kind of thing that happened uh, in Texas, and we fought. We were able to win, uh, at least to make sure that we didn't violate some of our own regulations. But it does take advocacy, and it's taking the knowledge that we have from science and bringing it uh, into that, into that uh, 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 legislative room or, or the, 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 the courthouse. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Last but not least. It's a challenge to speak for five minutes, but I'll do my best. I'm going to tweet you five tweets. First of all, I absolutely want to echo the fact that it's not enough to try to understand how we treat families and children and why do we treat them the way we do in the U.S. It is imperative that we understand why are they coming. And why are they coming has to be understood in a much larger context than answering the question of whether they are being killed in their own countries. Human rights is much more than one's life. The most advanced generation of rights speak of economic, social, cultural, and political rights. So we need to absolutely understand why are they coming if we are ever to be successful at tackling this challenge. Number two, what we are facing today is simply the evolution of an assault that was intellectually conceptualized about 40 years ago. The reason we accept 
putting people in the kind of conditions upon their arrival at the border is because many of us have inadvertently swallowed the ideology that suggests that foreign nationals are a threat. If you actually look at the evidence, you will see that foreign nationals of all kinds are actually a blessing to the United States of America and a blessing to their home country. But the only reason we treat them the way we do is because we have accepted white supremacy, we have accepted xenophobia, you know, we have accepted the narrative of threat. We absolutely need to understand that going forward, we are not going to succeed just by lawyering our way out of this mess, with all the heart and love I have for lawyers. <laughs> but we need a much more comprehensive political movement that has to be collaborative in nature, has to be multifaceted, and it has to be absolutely independent, driven by common purpose and common values. Number three, we must absolutely place the struggle for foreign nationals and their rights in larger context we must absolutely reconcile our efforts on behalf of foreign nationals in the context of economic inequality, measured by the way in which wealth and income is distributed, and understand why we are in that situation today. We must understand the role of white supremacy and racism, and we must understand also the sad condition of gender inequality in which we find ourselves. If we don't place our, our efforts in that larger context, we are bound to shoot ourselves in our own, foot, our own feet. Number four, going forward, we must trash once and for all the architecture, political and legislative architecture known as comprehensive immigration reform. It is trash, it's been trash, and it is a reflection of the ideology that I was referring to earlier in terms of how much we bought the idea that foreign nationals are a threat that have to be punished. We must understand that change going forward is likely to be much more nuanced, much more slow than we want, and most of all, we need to produce results. Number five, I absolutely believe that going forward, we all must do far more than we have already done, creating spaces for meaningful social interaction between US-born individuals and foreign-born individuals. Only through social meaningful interaction, we will ever be able to discover the common humanity that bound us and discover that we have far more in common that we have differences. And the last thing I wanna do is a commercial. On the 18th of October, we are having one more forum, not on family separation, but on the importance of keeping families together. It's going to be at Loyola, at the Water Tower Building. Go to our website, alianzaamericas.org, to get more information about it. And I'm sorry I took 20 seconds more than five minutes. <laughs> Okay, uh, fantastic uh, last panel. Um, I want to open it up to questions. Okay. My name is Fiti Muka. Uh, I am a psychologist. I come from Kosovo. I have uh, experienced personally both detention and deportation during the war in 1999 in Kosovo. So I have a personal reason for uh, asking this question. Of course, uh, I am aware of the importance of research, but uh, before that, I think that everyone agrees that um, this uh, kind of zero tolerance policy should stop and family separation should stop. Uh, we've heard a lot about evidence-based policies. Um, it's very important, right? Uh, however, I think that 
we have a lot of evidence. You provided a lot of evidence for the adverse impact of uh, family separation, adverse impact of detention. Even clinicians here provided a lot of evidence for the anxiety, depression, mental illness among uh, children who are uh, separated from their families. So I wonder how big is the gap in communication between uh, clinicians, researchers on one side and politicians or policymakers on the other one? And what kind of evidence, what kind of data we should provide in order to change the policy? Thank you. Awesome. Just to make a quick comment about it, you know, when I was saying earlier that we need to connect what we are facing with a larger issue, remember we are in the era of fake news, in the era where evidence and research does not seem to matter, and part of the struggle that we need to carry out is restoring something that is actually common sense. We should never do anything in the area of public policy that is not evidence-based. If we were acting based on evidence, nobody should be put in detention. As a matter of fact, it is a proven fact that most people who are released upon their own reconnaissance actually show up for their hearings, you know, in terms of their immigration proceed proceedings. The only reason they, there are people in detention facilities and we are restricting the number of refugees coming into the country is because it is something else, not evidence, what is driving that kind of policy decision. So we have our job cut out without doubt. I want to echo those comments, but I also want to add that I think it's incumbent on researchers and clinicians that, and I can say this because I'm a researcher, um, I've been trained as a researcher, that part of our training is really not what do you do with the evidence that you are gathering, how do you make it relevant to policy, how do you make it relevant to the daily lives of the people that your communities that you are interested in, that's kind of left in the hands of somebody else. And so I really think it's incumbent on us to think about what is the purpose of doing research? I don't think we need more evidence. I actually think we have plenty of evidence. Um, what we need is we need to figure out how do we take that evidence, put it in the hands of people who are gonna get it noticed. <laughs> to hold people accountable that practices such as family <laughs> detention or okay. detention practices in general are actually contrary to all the evidence but are also hum human, not inhumane practices. We don't need evidence to understand what's humane and inhumane. Um, but I really do think that researchers need a little bit of a kick in the rear <laughs> um, to really think about why are you doing this work? Why are you asking these research questions? Are these research questions relevant to people who are directly impacted? And if they're not, you have no right to do that research unless you're ready to take your results and move something forward that's going to have direct impact on those affected. Can I, do we have another? Wait, before I lose my job here, uh, <laughs> a researcher, you're trying to take my, no. Um, I'm I, myself I, I, No, I'm only kidding. Um, the, the, the issue, uh, it reminds me of, um, in, I think it was the 1950-something, uh, Hofstetler wrote a book, Pulitzer Prize winning book, uh, titled Anti-Intellectualism in American Life. Read that book today and just, especially chap the first chapter, just read that <laughs> chapter and change the names of the individuals. It's a part of our history that we reject science, that we reject learned uh, ideas and theories. It's, it's the rejection of knowledge because we want to get to the lowest common denominator, which is you know, the, the kind of the quotidian ideas about, about life, rather than thinking harder and deeper, whether it's about the you know, humanity and our common, our, our common humanity. Those things have been missing uh, in the US, uh, you know, in the public square, but even when we've been members of international groups. So we don't sign off on, on conventions of human rights because we think we think we've got it right, and we therefore don't have to sign on. So there is an entirely kind of an entire uh, environment that we've got to change. Uh, other questions? Yes. First, they came to, uh, for me for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jewish, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. 
Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. Um, we, as a nation, we were built on science, we were built on knowledge, but we were also built on values that we are forgetting. We built on a value, a special value of freedom, and also a special value of caring for others. And I think, Mr. Zaya, Oscar, um, we also need to remember, uh, especially many of us that have also immigrated to this country, that we have to embrace those values, and we have to speak out for those people that are suffering consequences. I'm very surprised that many Latinos that are in the elected officials, that are in the administration, are not speaking out of this. So I guess that that's the question. I mean, how do you see this? What is this happening? It's very simple, right? Like, elections have consequences, right? And we're coming up to a to an election, right? Going back to like making sure that we hold politicians accountable. Like, I know that somebody else had mentioned that a lot of the infrastructure that we currently have right now was created in the mid 1990s, right? A lot of these things is, uh, you know, I feel like with every administration, it just, it just, is, it just gets kicked up a notch, right? Where you know, in 1996, where, with, with Ira, Ira, there were a lot of things that affected our communities negatively, going from mandatory, uh, the, the three and 10 year bars, for example, that had prevented a lot of people from actually having their actual pathway to legalization. So when we think about election have consequences, I think that specifically to those Latinos, right, and actually to anybody who has a, a, a constituency that's directly impacted, we need to make sure that those who actually do have the, 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 the power to actually go out to the polls and vote, actually go out there and vote on issues and not actual candidates because of their Latino last names. I work in the healthcare field and I've primarily been in the suburbs of the Chicagoland area for the last six years and I just want to note that there are a lot of undocumented immigrants throughout the suburbs and the rural parts of Chicago that also need a lot of attention and a lot of services and we must not forget about them. In McHenry County, the sheriff there had still been detaining undocumented individuals and handing them over to ICE, despite whatever position the governor was able to take or the position that he took um, to you know, make that or remove that as a priority from the sheriff's department. Additionally, the mental health services in the suburbs are not as well um, accessible to families as probably some may be here in Chicago, even though we can provide more services. Um, in the city, and so I do want to just really emphasize and speak to the undocumented families throughout the suburbs of Chicago and, and a lot of the rural parts of the, in the country that also still have the fear to speak out and don't know where to go because they do not have access to those services in those parts of the country. Thank Additionally, you. I just want to note really quickly, it, I'm from Guatemala, yeah, <laughs> and um, I just want to say the president of Guatemala right now is causing a lot of fear to the country and the people there with his association with the Trump administration. And to your point, um, Asker, I believe is your name, um, you know, it is important for us to keep track of the, what's going on in these countries. The Guatemalan president has prevented the UN um, investigator that would uh, investigate corruption and human rights violations from entering back into the country. He has received the support of the Trump administration, and we just have to keep focused and put pressure on these uh, administrations in our own countries and make sure that the U.S. is also putting pressure upon them. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Um, any other comments, questions? My name is Xochitl Galeano. I'm actually uh, born and raised in Nicaragua, and I'm a pediatrician on the west side of Chicago. <laughs> so sorry, I know you meant this to be quick, <laughs> but I just want to make a comment uh, regarding the question that was made that yes, there's a lot of clinicians and researchers and then how do we get this story to our politicians? Basically, I think the problem is that number one, academia does not look like us. Um, and number two, that a lot of academia, uh, they do the research, but in occasions then do not have the personality or the interest to be able to interact with politicians. So when it comes to politicians, you know, they, they're not gonna read a whole 30 paper research that someone did. What they go on and they hang on to is like riveting stories, stories that can make it in the news, stories that they can go on and take a picture with that person that went through that story. Okay. So I think that those are the things that we need to do best. And we as a community, uh, when you have people or people that you know that are interested in research, and I mean people like, that look like us, okay, African Americans and Hispanics, and you have people that 
that you know that they're interested in those things, academia and research, and on top of that, look like us, and on top of that, are interested in topics like this, just um, support them in any way that you can. Because when you go on into, you know, um, PhDs and medical school and MD, PhD, there is just not enough people like us. So that is the way that I think that we can get the message out. I just, I mean, there's, it is really hard, okay. but just support everybody that you know that is in that path. Okay, thank you for that comment. One of the things I like about UIC as an institution is UIC is one, values diversity, values diversity amongst faculty and students. So I think that we do see a lot of, a, a, a lot of diversity amongst the people doing this kind of work. Um, also has a great tradition of engaged research, not research for research sakes, but research in partnership with communities. Um, and also uh, practices research translation, which is the short term for what you all are talking about. How do you translate research findings into something that a policymaker would find relevant and accessible? Um, that being said, uh, we have a long ways to go. So thank you for that comment. Uh, Last shot. Who wants to make any, any further comments before we close? What are we to do at the local and state level? You know, many of us care concerned about immigrants and refugees often say, we want this, we want that, we want that for immigrants and refugees. But in a city like Chicago, in a state like Illinois, like many others, what we really need to be fighting for is much more generous economic, social, cultural development programs properly funded that include deliberately foreign-born populations as well. Because otherwise, we fall into the trap of sounding like we are asking for something special for immigrants when there are a lot of people in need of those very services that we inadvertently, again, sound the wrong way. Uh, number two, I absolutely believe that political engagement matters, but frankly, we need to go beyond the days of mobilizing because I'm opposing somebody, because I am against one thing. We need to understand that unless we put forward an inspirational, visionary platform to really make people want to go and vote, we are going to have a hard time. I don't know if you've been following the elections up to now, but voter turnout is very concerning, especially among Latinos, by the way. And the last thing I wanna say is, ideology is in the house, so to speak. And ideology, by definition, is juxtaposed you know, with evidence and knowledge. And a lot of the people we have in Congress, in state houses, in city councils today, are driven by ideology, which makes our job harder in terms of getting to a point where evidence and knowledge, in the end, gets the day. Okay, thank you very much. I wanna give a hand to this panel. Uh, Everybody was fantastic. Why don't you just stay here for a second? Um, Andreas Feldman from Institute for Humanities Global Migration Working Group is going to um, give the final benediction or whatever we call it. Um, and, then, and then we're out of here. I didn't know he was a priest. I'm going to give you a Jewish benediction. That's going to be difficult. But anyhow, I think this has been a very energizing and inspiring morning. Um, I'll take two minutes, I promise. Um, I just would like to, in a way, underscore a few things that I think we, we get out of this really fascinating discussion. On the one hand, I think the crisis we are facing really needs a multifaceted response. And I think I would underscore that what we are talking here could be basically be reflected or discussed in, in Australia, in Germany, in the Middle East, everywhere. This is a global crisis. And I think this is a, an imperative element that we need to take into account. This is not just about what's going on in the U.S., although we, we just you know, refer to that, but it's a much more broader and disconcerting phenomenon. So I think that in many ways, the, the main challenge here is to sort of link the efforts of this, in a way, different communities 
to, in a way, deploy the knowledge of academia and the expertise of people doing legal work uh, into and translated into an effective political strategy that in a way changes the, the conditions we are seeing. I think this is probably what, what we get out of this. This is easier said than done, but I think this is, a, this is the beginning of a conversation that is very interesting. And that leads me to the thinking moment. I think that uh, the two people who have been really working on this and the conceptualization of this really interesting uh, event are Professor Vine and Professor Cordova. And I think that this, in a way, reflects what the spirit behind what we discussed this morning, how people doing research in, in mental health and, and medicine and people doing work in, in urban or social sciences can get together, but with a very sort of open mind by bringing people who are doing work either in academia or in, in civil society, in advocacy, in legal work and the like, and bring them together and let them talk uh, and, and, and sort of creatively try to come up with, with interesting and, and hopefully fruitful solutions. So, Thank you for everyone who came here and attended this long morning. Thank you to uh, the organizers and to the teams that actually really worked uh, very hard in this. And in particular, thank you to, the, uh, to our guests that have been really magnificent. Some of them came out of town. And well, I look forward to seeing you soon uh, back. And it has been a really pleasure to, to be here. Thank you. Thank you.